Okay, so um, Unipro just provides uh, some uh, physical transport, but there is no application layer on top of it. So that where uh, come uh, Grebus. Grebus has been designed to provide all the features missing uh, for Unipro, such as uh, hot plug and unplug, uh, the discovery of the modules uh, themselves. And uh, also, uh, it provides some uh, RPC uh, protocol uh, to, to communicate with the, the module. Basically, it provides some class and protocols. So there is a, a protocol to control remotely the GPIO of the module. Uh, I don't know if uh, people there are uh, do know Grebus. Okay, so there is a lot of uh, classes supported, is, uh, supported by Grebus. Uh, so for uh, IoT, a couple of one are very interesting, uh, such as uh, I2C, SPI, GPIO, uh, eventually PWM, and uh, UART. So just to, to correctly understand how Grebus is working, uh, we need to speak about uh, how it was supposed to work on the smartphone before to explain how it will work uh, if we want to use it for uh, IoT. So the first thing here is uh, the Linux, uh, the host. So Grebus is running uh, the, uh, on the host. Uh, to handle the hot plug, uh, the removal of the modules, uh, there were the SVC, so it was uh, a little microcontroller, and this was just uh, checking the presence of the module. And uh, if a module was inserted, then it was uh, controlling the switch to create some route uh, between the, the, the CPU and the module inserted. So if we had the modules, the switch should uh, create the route between the new module and the CPU. Uh, each, each module is connected using uh, an interface, with the new in an Unipro interface. So basically there is uh, one uh, Unipro um, bus here. The switch has a sum, and so the switch uh, will dispatch the data coming from this one to this one. A module could have uh, more than one interface. Uh, still, I don't have an example of that, but it's cool. Uh, once a module is uh, ready to communicate, uh, the route has been created, uh, the module uh, should enumerate uh, itself and declare uh, what it supports, uh, what feature it wants to export to the host. So here in the example, we are exporting, exporting GPIO and uh, S2C. Uh, so then, So yeah, at the end, uh, the Grebus should uh, create all the virtual interfaces uh, and make usable uh, everything on ev exposed by the module on the host. Uh, so just uh, here's an example of uh, how the device uh, describes uh, itself. So just there is uh, the interface itself. Uh, we could have one or more. Basically, we have one. Then we have the bundles that describe uh, some uh, high-level features, such as a uh, camera, uh, or if we want to do GPIO, thing like that. And then the support that describe really uh, the protocol we want to, to use, if we want to describe a GPIO, an s or any low-level bus. 
here is just a short example of uh, of a manifest uh, that describes the device, the module. And once we insert the module, uh, we have access to all the uh, usual uh, uh, CSFS and API provided by the kernel. So we could use the GPIO on the module as it was on the host. Uh, so this, this feature is very useful for uh, IoT. Uh, so first, uh, Rebus is uh, free, is already present in the kernel. Uh, it has been, has been merged in the kernel uh, 4.9 uh, and now is going out of uh, staging. So it already is there and ready to use. Uh, the idea uh, with uh, Grebus is to keep the intelligence of the application uh, inside the host. So you don't have to write uh, a complex firmware to handle some tasks. So you just have to provide the firmware that could handle Corebus request and just uh, the low level drivers and, and that is. And the host will do everything for us. So the idea will be to have one gateway that runs uh, Grebus. Uh, so the gateway uh, run discovers the models. So if we use TCP IP, uh, we could uh, use uh, Avai 0conf to discover a module, by example. We could use uh, the Bluetooth stack to discover a mode of Bluetooth. Uh, and for other protocols, there is probably some uh, other discovery mechanism. Uh, then, once uh, the module is uh, detected, we could add it and load the driver we need to use. We could eventually also start an application and start to use all the interfaces created by uh, Grebus. So, we on the module, uh, we just have to control the hardware, just have to provide the low level drivers and a small Grebus uh, stack to handle the request. And we let the gateway do everything. No need to write some driver. If you have a temperature sensor, for example, uh, we just have to provide uh, the driver for the S4C and let the host uh, do the S4C request. Uh, so here is just an example of what uh, would like, what look like Rebus if we use for uh, IoT. So here we have removed the SVC and the, um, and the switch since it was something specific to uh, the uh, ARA smartphone. So we just replace them by the G-Bridge. So G-Bridge uh, provides the uh, discovery and the um, outplug and plug features that was uh, provided by the SVC and the switch. So the, the role of GBridge is to connect uh, to Grebus and then to detect if something, uh, if we had a new module to connect it and then to pass the data from the GBridge to the kernel using uh, Netlink. Yes? Speak into the top of it, okay. Oh, that <laughs> works actually. <laughs> All right, this is kind of. Uh, anyway, um, GBridge use, lives in um, user space today, right? Is is that yes. um, is that where it would continue to live? It seems kind of out of um, uh, step to me to kind of add, to have you know something that's going out and talking to the the hardware interfaces um, in order to get to gray bus underneath. Um, do we want to have GBridge live in user space, or should, is there some way that that uh, could be? I think for uh, many use cases, uh, that makes sense to have GBridge in user space. Uh, basically, if we talk about uh, Bluetooth, uh, I don't know if it's easy to use Bluetooth inside the kernel space. Uh, in user space, we have a uh, very easy and nice uh, BlueZ. You could use it to detect uh, the Bluetooth modules, things like that. Uh, same for um, TCP IP. <coughs> I before to use uh, GB net, uh, to use Netlink, uh, I tried to use uh, TCP IP 
uh, from the kernel and uh, it was a mess. Probably because I didn't use the stack as expected, but it was very slow and was very hard to write. And uh, when I switched to uh, Netlink, I gained a lot of performances and was easier to write and to maintain. So I think for, for most of the uh, bus IoT buses, uh, radio, things like that, it will be easier and uh, more efficient to do it in your space. If we want to do something like uh, using a bus for uh, USB, something I would like to use to do some prototyping, uh, in that case, it would be better to have it in the kernel. But uh, except for that, uh, I don't think so. How are you getting from the kernel to Qbridge today? How are you tying into the Gravis core? Uh, cu currently, uh, it's use a, a Netlink. Oh, uh, so you have a you have a, a separate module. Yes. So you have a Netlink. The there is okay. a, a Netlink module that uh, create uh, that acts act like the AP. Okay. So why haven't you sent that to me? <laughs> <laughs> I sent uh, an RFC uh, three years ago, and uh, since I didn't have uh, the time to work on okay. it. Okay, all right, I remember that was a long so time ago. Okay. So since now uh, Grebus is uh, moving out of staging, uh, I think I will send uh, a new uh, a new patch. Okay, good. All right, thanks. With some fix. Uh, yeah. Okay, any other question? Okay. So here is just an example of uh, what uh, a board that could run a uh, Grebus. I still have not write the firmware for it. Uh, but the idea would be to have uh, a small operating system, uh, such as uh, Zephyr, to run it on a small microcontroller, such as uh, the uh, TI-1, and just uh, write a Grebus stack to control the peripheral drivers to control the drivers provided by the, the operating system. Basically, to implement, to use the GPIO driver to control the GPIO, things like that. So using an operating system just as uh, Zephyr will make uh, Grebus very easy to use in a uh, microcontroller. Uh, still, I didn't de did it uh, by lack of time. Uh, I hope some uh, soon I will do it. Uh, so currently, Gbridge uh, only support two. Um, no, only support two protocol. Uh, two. It supports Bluetooth, and it supports uh, TCP/IP. Uh, I've not tested them for a long time, so I don't know if Bluetooth is still working. And I know that uh, TCP/IP is broken, but uh, some people are working on it. So. Hopefully, we'll be fi fixed soon. <coughs> uh, so, there is a couple of uh, limitations uh, if we want to use uh, Grebus for IoT. Uh, the performances could be one. Uh, the, the protocol, um, some protocol only send one uh, RPC at a time. So, if you have uh, high latency on your uh, on your communication medium, uh, they could break the performances, since we have to wait uh, until the uh, RPC come to grab us and then come uh, come to the module and then come back before to send another one. For IoT, it should not be a big issue because uh, the bus the, the medium are slow, but in the same time there is not a lot of data to exchange. So if we take a temperature sensor, we just want to measure it to get the temperature once for X, uh, for a minute, ba basically. I'm sorry. So when you say not much data, how much data are you actually talking about? I mean, what kind of, if you have like a temperature sensor with just a few bytes, how much overhead is Grey Boss adding to that? 
Uh, if you transfer it, for example, over a wireless link or something. I think the header is uh, 8 bytes. And after that, uh, you could also uh, add some overhead for, um, if you consider uh, sending an SQRC command, you will have also the overhead of the SQRC command itself. Okay. Plus the data you will get from the... Okay, good, that's, that's the number for me, it's next. So after there is a thing, something important missing, which is a remote wake up. So you, the power, uh, there is some pro some protocol to control the power of the model. Uh, still, there is uh, some features such as the remote wake up is that is missing. So if we suspend the module, uh, there is nothing to remote it, uh, to wake up it from the host. So the module have to wake up itself and to send the data if there's something happening. Uh, if there's something missing, it uh, should be added. And as, I uh, as we talk, uh, there is some overhead uh, due to the protocol. So this could have some consequences of the power. And uh, currently there is no security, uh, so the data are sent as is uh, without uh, encryption between G-Bridge uh, and the modules. So for Bluetooth, it could be okay since Bluetooth could provide uh, some encryption. Uh, for TCP IP, uh, it could be an issue, and for other protocols as well. Uh, so I know um, uh, Chris is working on the encryption, so we are going to have it soon. Yeah, he's got some fun stuff he showed earlier today with the, the encryption stuff working, so that was kind of good. I'm gonna do a little bit of an asynchronous question here because I wanna ask you about um, um, <coughs> uh, one of the questions that's come up on the list, which is um, manifests and additional platform data because a lot of these sensors that you wanna connect up um, don't have um, the necessary platform data, so a manifest file on its own is not gonna give you, say, an interrupt for an accelerometer. So how, how do we get an accelerometer to just to show up in this environment? How have you envisioned something like an accelerometer that has an interrupt dependency to show up um, automatically? And um, you know, where would, and what do you think about the suggestion that we add additional platform data to manifest um, in some reasonable backwards compatible way? We were talking about uh, DTBO, right? Uh, to use uh, some DTB at some point. At uh, some point, we we talked okay. about DTBO, <coughs> but you know, the thing with DTBO is DTBO is not upstream, and um, we've you know I, I don't know if um, um, Roland's I don't see him around here, but uh, Frank. Um, so I, I saw Frank. I, I saw Frank wandering the, the halls at lunch. So um, at least I think I think it was Frank. <laughs> Um, but I, he has pushback on using um, overlays in the, the main line. I think security is, is, is one of them, you know, with, with, with device tree overlays, um, dynamic, um, they can, you know, crop up other issues. I mean, yes, we can have overlays applied statically, but, um, you know, it, it seems like this should be dynamic, um, especially based on how dynamic these, these different devices are. So is there a way that we can put that into the platform data? In, in the in the manifest, yeah. Greg says yes, so yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, you, you're good with that approach. We can like we can work together on that. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know how we could do it. Uh, I'm not sure to understand. Uh, so. I know. Uh, I remember we were using uh, some drivers to handle that, <coughs> at some point. Uh, we were uh, hard coding it in the driver, at least on the internal kernel. Uh, I don't know how we could do it uh, correctly now. So uh, for what you've designed and <coughs> talk about, you don't need it. But for what Jason's talking about, you do need it, which took me a long time to figure out, sorry, <laughs> that you guys, how you need it. But no, we, we always discussed this. We would have to solve it someday. We were hoping four years ago that device tree overlay would be done. <laughs> um, but if we do something like that, I don't, we never saw a problem with doing something like that. We can do it on our own. It's just, 
for the amount of data you need, it's very tiny and very specific per device. Like I2C needs these things. I don't and see the, us having The challenge gets to be we need to do it for every single device and right for if we. Well, every we single protocol type will have um, unique things. Uh, it, it, whatever has additional augmented data. Like it, if it's all it is is an interrupt, then like for every single uh, device that all it needs extra is an interrupt. And then you get into the, some things like the spy displays yeah, yeah, that yeah, take like five different parameters. But those are those are not the, the norm, right? Usually it's just I need a reset line, I need to interrupt, and uh, yeah, you don't have to have that many different. No, and if we steal from the device tree overlay, I have no problem with that. You know, it's the same idea, right? Let's do the same thing. We can, and if we ever get real device tree overlay, we can merge into that eventually. But if we put in the spec in a, in a backwardly compatible way. I'm, I'm trying to understand a little bit of what your uh, gray bus for IoT space. I just read gray bus stuff and I understand where it's coming in the phone space. Where yes. Okay, and, and, and I can also see that it has some, some issues um, that USB and PCI, you know, and, and the, what was the most terrible one was FireWire, right? You know, you could just DMA to and from memory here and there. That's kind of really <laughs> a bad thing, right? Um, so. So I get the impression that you want something a little bit higher, uh, uh, more resilient than that, okay? And then you start talking about Bluetooth, and I totally missed that, okay? So what I understood is this was a way to talk with wires within, within a device that might be modular, but that mostly you don't hand out to random strangers to plug random things into the, your device. But the things that you do plug in may be a little bit, you know, you may not totally trust them. You don't want them DMAing. If you're going to start talking about wireless, there's lots of wireless protocols, 15.4, Bluetooth itself, V6 over Bluetooth, all sorts of stuff that really do work well and are being used in IoT space right now. But what I'm hearing is this is about how to talk to a microcontroller to run some GPIO pins that might do spy to a temperature sensor, and we need an interrupt somewhere back, right? Yes. And I, I, I'm just trying to understand, like, when would you really use this in this space? It sounds like it's like a Lego version of IoT where you're just going to assemble some stuff out of things. That would be really cool, cause, but um, I'm just trying to understand that actually Lego would actually be a really good form factor for doing it too. Um, <laughs> and Lego probably would hire you to make this work because um, they keep wanting it. But uh, is that, was that what I understand? Because I'm just not really getting what the, what the threat model is that we have to deal with. Yeah, so you, you correctly understand, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we really just control uh, the IOs from the remote modules from the host. Uh, so no. the well, you I said door, the guy next to me said door locks. And I say no, because the door lock either has a 15.4 or Wi-Fi or something interface to it, and we need to click it, or it's integrated in part of the thing. So it's not the door lock itself, it's the GPIO that runs the door lock, is it? So the is to provide a generic protocol to describe those devices on the other side of a transport. So you'd use Bluetooth for your transport, you use whatever, Graybus did not define a transport layer or a physical layer there. So you can tunnel it across the networking, you tunnel it across USB over, inf and then Unipro, you can tunnel it over anything you want. It's just a protocol that describes a device on the other side that you're going to talk to. The other side of a o other side of that of that wire, of of a, of the wire, which is a wire, no, right? It can be or the other side of a connection. So, so I'm I'm taking exception exception with that other side of the connection because it's a significant different different threat model when you say it's not just I can't physically know what's connected. You can't physically know what's connected. You're uh, trusting. You're trusting the module to describe itself in a way that is not lying. So, so that's what I'm saying. So we've gotten into remote attestation and all mm -hmm. sorts of other stuff. Okay. Here. So, so uh, the worst thing if a device lies is you send it data for a serial port that it really isn't a serial port. Okay. So, so you're trusting it to not lie about its type is what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I, I get that, but I'm still don't understand how does that fit into the what what is the space that this fits into that, and your posting says that USB was inappropriate for, and 15.4 was inappropriate for. Um, 
That was a hardware decision not made by me. Okay, <laughs> but fair enough, okay, fair enough. But the goal of this was to not allow DMA access to, you can plug in an untrusted device that's not gonna hurt your host, okay. except by what you decide to send to that device. Okay, be that's it audio data, be it, if it's gonna say it's a serial port, you're gonna start saying, oh, that's really a serial port, I'm gonna send serial data across. So it's, it's a secure way, it's not gonna mess with you, like DMA. So okay, we so have I no, get it. We have no way it. to describe, cool. there's no way to, a, to describe a GPIO port or a, U, or a USB device, or a, sorry, I2C device or any of the, one of those things in a standardized way. No protocol has that. Got it. This I understand now. That. Thank you, Greg. I just wanted to maybe suggest also that it was potentially Unipro. Did Unipro have trusted platform sort of stuff on it where it would identify itself securely to no. the. No, okay. <laughs> Unipro yeah. defined the physical layer, right? And that was about it. Yeah, it was like, it left the whole data to us. That's why we had to make this. <laughs> and we gave this to the Unipro people, but they're off making other things right now. So I think in the, in, the, in the last kind of block we have of the day, I think we're gonna get back to this pretty heavily because we're gonna talk about use cases in that, in that, uh, in that presentation, this was kind of, Alexander's kind of got the underlying technology idea, and that's what we're kind of building off of some of our thoughts that, uh, that we're gonna close with, and we wanted to make sure to bring those up. I wanted to try to um, respect the next presenter's time um, and get that topic. Do you have anything that you wanna wrap up um, in closing thoughts as um, our next presenter comes up? Yeah, so ju just to compare, there is a lot of work uh, remaining to do. Uh, if so first upstream uh, the netlink modules uh, I still have to write uh, a stack for uh, an operating system eventually add some other uh, uh, medium and uh, so if some people inter are interested in it, I don't have a lot of time to, to, to development, but I will be happy to respond to your question and things like that uh, by email or to see, to, to uh, review pull request, something like that. So uh, that's it. My laptop. The, uh, we got the USB drive, we just didn't have the laptop. Yeah, she's got it up there right now. Yeah, she's got it right there. She's got a Mac. This is, I wish we had a. Just so that all of you got a mentor here. So you got the uh, mic on? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. It's quicker we can get into discussions. Yes, I totally get that.
monitors. important for IOT and just the fact that all of you are in this room it means you all agree with me. So let's see what the state of the union is. Can we make it easier? Etc. etc. So OT and IOT, what do we need? There are implementation trade-offs and really the meat of the discussion that I really want to get us to is kernel focus to make this easier. So we need over the air updates so that we can Hello there. Okay. <laughs> hello. Hello, hello, hello. So uh, we want OTA so that we can distribute security patches, so we can issue bug fixes, and so we can introduce new features. And what's out there in terms of requirements? Quite a lot. It has to work across the whole software stack, even hardware. So it could be your bootloader, your firmware, your kernel, your application. It's got to be robust. You don't want something to drop in the middle and become a brick. You want it to be atomic so that whatever happens, it's either the old state or the new state, but nothing in between. You'd like it to be automated so that somebody doesn't have to go and say, do it right now. Auditable, who did what, when, where, why. Uh, preserve any user data in case you've configured some endpoint from which you want to pull down your updates. Uh, you want it to be trusted. And of course, everything should be encrypted, all your transmission, and that kind of follows on from the previous talk too. Oh wait, let's just go back one. Um, what are the options out there in terms of implementation? There are trade-offs over there. Do you want push or do you want to pull your updates? Do you want some inline kind of update or do you want to have some shadow partition? There's more resiliency, more robustness with shadow partitions. But then this brings up issues like what should the size of that partition be? I have to allocate space for that, dri drives up the cost. And do I want to use the block kind of approach with the signature and say, hey, you know, I've got the whole block and nothing but the block and it signatures one, two, three, four, everything is good, let's launch it. Or do we want to go the file system approach? I mean, the files and each file that you're going to bring over, what its hash code is, and that's the leaner, meaner approach. So there are a lot of trade-offs in this. So what do we have in terms of solutions out there? Many. Lots and lots of solutions out there. There's OS3, which is a file-based approach. There's Belina IO. Software updates, Swoop D, Mender IO, and the list goes on. And all of these solutions make various trade offs. And let's now talk about IoT. Are we guaranteed that my whole network of devices has one kind of hardware? No. Am I guaranteed it has one kind of software? No. Am I guaranteed that it has a certain kernel version, even if it was all Linux based? No. So say a whole bunch of no, no, no's. So we're really talking about a heterogeneous environment of hardware and software, and we want a solution that works across all of these. But one other thing we can guarantee, that nobody's going to maybe install hardware that's more expensive than we absolutely need. So there might be somewhere high up in your software stack, maybe in your data center, a big Xeon server for this IoT you know, solution, and it's all in your data center, and it's maybe the brain of the whole thing that controls everything. Sure, you might spend a few thousand dollars there. But then maybe at the edge, uh, where things get collected, and that's closer to the source of the data, you might have maybe a couple of hundred dollars kind of hardware. 
and way, way down at the actual devices and sensors. It might be a few cents or it might even be a few dollars. So we're guaranteed that we're gonna have a lot of variety over there and we'd like a solution that flows across all this and meets different needs. We're already at the meat of the discussion. What I wanna broach here, suggest here, ask for your brains to bring your firepower and make happen is, can we introduce kernel hooks for this? You know, just like you have reboot command in your Linux kernel and it's just supported, you say reboot and it does it, how about an update kind of command? And what else do we need for this update command? We need some basic configuration. Configuration that might set the source the source from where you want to pull down updates. Uh, keys, so that you can have encrypted communication between this endpoint and the server that provides you these solutions. Uh, you might want to have a schedule. Do this every night or do it when there's you know, idle time, nothing much happening, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what about where should the logs live? How often should you uh, even do these re-attempts? Like, was I able to connect to the server or not? Should I try three times? Should I try 10 times? Whatever. Um, what else, like a list? Uh, if you're like a, an edge gateway node, maybe you have like 100 children, 1,000 children, or maybe you're in a peer-to-peer -peer kind of communication with some ad hoc network, and one of the nodes gets this uh, next patch that you have to update your systems to, then maybe you want all your sibling nodes to get this update. So if we could have a configuration option for this command and then just be able to say update, everything should be hunky-dory and under the covers, whether you use SwoopD or software update or you know, Mendelio or whatever, it should just kind of happen seamlessly. And there's an analogy to this. I mean, we have um, hypervisors, we have KVM, we have Zen, we have you know, VMware's ESXi, et cetera, et cetera. But what helps us to talk the same language? Do I have a question? Uh, I, I, I want somebody to ask a question. Yeah, I, this just brings up a lot of obvious questions sure. for people. And this is an imaginary command, right? I'm looking for somebody to have some questions. That was actually what I was going to say. Um, it, d does this imply that there's a Linux or some sort of processor with a powerful enough processor to run a command prompt? Do you need this? Is this on the device or is this? So s IoT is not one device, right? There's a whole software stack. I really hate this mic. Oh. Um, <laughs> can you still hear me, everyone? Yeah, but the recording won't hear you. Oh, OK, OK. Sorry, sorry for posterity. Uh, so no. Think about your IoT stack. There's something up there in the data center. There's stuff at the edge. There's stuff way down below. Might as well be fussy. Not too bad. All right, great. Hi, can everyone hear me? No. Nope. Yeah. Fit closer to your your face, maybe. Move the mic up to your necklace. Yes. I'm not sure. We have lots of time. Hi everyone. Yes. Awesome. So, so this is this is what I imagine. This is what I imagine, and and I'll mention first of all that for the format and the and and uh, some of the transport, there's an ITF working group for that, um, which is dealing with most of this, but is actually very careful not to specify transport, but rather content. Um, but um, I haven't mentioned transport. I know you haven't mentioned transport. Yeah. So so um, so transport is a, is a, is something that you might like to think about, but. Um, the thing I wanted to say is 
So the, the, that working group is mostly saying, look, we're going up to, but uh, not quite including things like Android phones where you kind of get your whole image as a single blob. We're not doing file by file kind of things, um, but, but mostly down into devices that are door opening things, right, that we discussed before. But imagine the case where you'd have a kernel that knows where its image was. It was executed in place, maybe. It knows where its init RAM FS was, because maybe it was kind of execute or uncompress in place. And you could say to this kernel, I would like you to somehow uh, update things and magically k exec into the new code without dropping any packets. That would be a kernel hook that would totally rock and maybe impossible to do. But that's where I would imagine it would a kernel thing. Everything else, it should happen elsewhere up of the stack, right? OpenWRT, you run a, what is it, SW update or something like this, and it knows where the right flash partition is to update, and it does all of this already. Okay. So, so, so hang on there. The underlying implementation should know where things are and how to execute it. If, it. if it knows where things are and how to do it, then it could go in the kernel. But otherwise, the kernel is probably ignorant about where things are and so how so it so got so to so lie. Ho hold lit. that thought. What I want is, how many of you know about libvirt? Yeah. Libvirt? Libvirt. Okay. So I, I saw like five, six hands. What was the... L-I-B-V-I-R-T, libvirt. Why is libvirt even there? Why is it useful? You have so many different hypervisors. You have so much, so many different kinds of hardware. But when you use a libvirt library and you drop it in there, any you know, OpenStack implementation, a vCenter implementation, a Kubernetes, whatever, it can execute a command like launch this virtual machine, okay? It just could be agnostic of the actual hardware and the software that's running on which hypervisor. So this provides you that glue that is like a single language. That so you basically want an abstraction API. Exactly. So that's what I'm proposing. That's all I'm saying. I want like a, an API here. An API that says update, uh, and the update can take some configuration commands. And then under the covers, whether you use Mender.io or you have software update, it does the right thing. But what if you had not installed that package over there, the, the one that will provide you this update facility, it'll just say, oh, oh, you know, not implemented. But then an IoT solution vendor does not have to know what they install, and maybe somewhere in the middle where it's an expensive thing and you want a partition and be able to do something more resiliently, you have done that. But at deep down lower layers, it could be something very inline, and if it became a brick too bad type of stuff. So. I'm just trying to think about this IoT landscape as we have adoption to make it easier. Yeah, Chris, well, you were I, saying something and I interrupted you. I was, yeah. uh, no, please go ahead. I think you answered my question. Please go ahead. I think we'll probably get lots more questions. So, so this is all question time. I have really no more slides oh, okay. and I just have right. two slides for like the whole pile of references. And pretty much just about every one of those solutions says how I can do it, what my trade-offs are, but how can we tie all this together and why is it necessary to do so? Why is it that we even have the Linux kernel? Because there's some operations everybody needs. And I think this one, the time has come to make it kind of like so an API that's available. Why is it important for VMware to do this? Why does it matter whether VMware is asking you? Just because I have the VMware name and T-shirt? No, I'm just talking about IoT. I'm an open source engineer. I'm working on an open source project called EdgeX that's you know, just open source. But I do know that as an end user of IoT, I need to be sure that my hardware and my system gets updated. Um, I, I used to, in a, in a previous, previous life, I, I was working for a Zigbee outfit. And I know that Zigbee has this whole standard for doing software updates that does uh, uh, integrity uh, checks, like a block-based integrity check uh, with, a, with a download, and you can do it to an off-chip EEPROM or something like that, um, like block by block, and in some cases you'll have a dual partition set up, in some cases you'll have a single partition set up. Um, so it, you're right in that there are so many different varieties of update formats for the specific image. Um, what, are there any, is there a way, like do you have a, a suggestion for what format would work for all of them, I guess, is the, the question I'm asking. So 
for one thing, let's pretend you're in a software stack and you know, and you have your whole system. The way I envisage IoTs, there's some cloud component, there are a whole bunch of edge or gateways. Hey, come on, everyone, join in the discussion. You're in this room. Grab that mic from him. Throw it randomly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they're not alert, it's like a wedding bouquet. <laughs> Thank you. So your, one of your earliest slides, you listed a bunch of solutions that already exist, and a few of those are actually open source, right, yep. already. So what's missing from the existing open source ones that you that think you, you think needs to be replaced or redone or done better or whatever? That's, I think that's the part so, I'm missing so, from so this talk. So the part that you totally hit on is there are multiple open source solutions. But if I want to deal with a heterogeneous environment and I don't maybe have control about which open source packages installed to, you know, implement update on some node somewhere in this whole, you know, tree of IoT, you know, from north to south, I should still be able to give it a command saying update yourself. And if it's being, you know, as part of the registration process and installation of the software, it's pointing to some, uh, you know, let's call this my autonomous car endpoint, it should do the right thing. So, so imagine like a hot plug event. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's got to be some piece of software in the system that would receive the hot plug event that says equivalent, you know, I guess it's the uh, replug yourself event, um, and that's what you're looking for, and that's what you're thinking that, that there needs to be a, a, it has to be a kernel service that abstracts it such that things can, can uh, something can act on it, one of those open source projects you mentioned, yes. but that, that, that then allows the decision as to when to do it and all this kind of stuff to be isolated from the decision as to what and who and is what's authorized. And the kernel might know this is a bad time to do this because I'm just going into suspend or I have no power or mm -hmm. something. That's yes. what you're asking for, I guess. Yes, I am exactly asking for an, a, you know, an API interface that you, know, you can set up things like policies so that's my configuration part. You can you know, break it up even more if you want. And then the actual how it happens is the underlying software, open source, or other that implements it. Why would you put this in the kernel and not a user space service? That's fine. But typically, I was thinking about update being you know, like a root process and you know, needs quite a lot of privileges. And that's why I was thinking kernel. And another reason I thought kernel is like all the other downstream projects and OSs take from there, but I'm you know, open to whatever you suggest here. I mean, we don't put web services in various, well, there has historically <laughs> been in the past <laughs> web services in the kernel. Um, but yeah, it, it looks to me very much like a user space daemon or a user space API that runs, could be on the device, could be as a central service. Um, but, yeah. So, the only thing I wanted to add was one place is the KExec stuff that got brought up, right? Because that one is something that does actually require a kernel open source. But again, it's about when. So if the when is, is now, now you can actually, okay, am I up to date? Now can do a KExec. Yeah, but I mean that still generally comes from a user space policy. So your thing is, because I'm having some user space policies, it's better it stays in user space. Okay. So I guess my question is similar. Generally speaking, policy stays out of the kernel, for sure. But implementation mechanism hooks, if they're needed, absolutely. So the question, I guess, is if we're telling the device, update yourself, where in, in this picture does the policy for what gets updated and all of that land? Is that, is that with the device or is, that, or is that unspecified here? So for me, when I set up these devices as an IoT, let's say it's, it's the car, autonomous car that I know you don't trust right now. <laughs> uh, that's definitely like when it's parked in the garage and it's not driving. So that's a policy that you set up when you, you know, install this software in the car and, and all across the thing. So I think that policy will come as part of the registration onboarding of the software. The rest is just like the execution. And for me, another thing is sometimes, what if I don't have network connectivity, but there is a patch available somewhere. Um, maybe if I can transmit it 
you know, to my neighbors that are nearby in a network, like you got it to one of your cars at home, but you wanted all the other cars at home to get it. There might be a trusted sibling set, but still the whole trust pieces, you know, the signatures have to match and things like that. That's kind of where I was going with this list, you know, who all should get updates so I could serve it in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion too to make updates go further. Uh, I guess um, since we've been talking quite a bit about um, kernel space and user space and what, what belongs where, uh, one question I sort of had was, so um, again, I'm kind of relating back to the Zigbee world, which is my previous, previous life. Um, so in that case, there was a secure section of memory that would only be accessible by the operating system, whatever that happened to be, uh, for uh, keys, decryption keys. Um, for updates and other sorts of things. Uh, 802.15.4 has uh, an, a, like a, a standard encryption layer, but that's just for channel communication. It's not for OTA updates. Um, do we have, maybe someone else knows better in the Linux kernel right now, do we have a, a place to store trusted keys that only the Linux kernel has available? Yeah. yeah. Okay, what, what is it called? I don't remember. I don't remember, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. well named. So, yeah, uh, so yes. you've got the TPM, which is a piece of hardware that is non-recoverable, um, but you also have like keys, uh, Secure Boot can also provide hardware layer keys, um, and then there's also the kernel keychain, okay. which can be um, built in at kernel build time or enrolled in other... Uh, I don't know the exact implementation uh, so details. So the, uh, the trust TPM, Trusted Platform Module, uh, it's got a whole bunch of things in there. Uh, when you boot, it basically captures the hash code of your boot process, I mean, your BIOS, your firmware, your kernel, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things by doing this sort of abstraction API layer is, let's say it's a very expensive device and a lot is at stake, like a car or you know, hospital machinery, that sort of implementation will have a TPM. But maybe something else might not have a TPM. It might have a firmware TPM that's cheaper or a software TPM that's really cheap. So the actual implementation I'd like to keep abstract because of that. But then another thing is, let's say you're a provider of uh, IoT infrastructure. There's actual code that might be different that's application centric, like okay, the temperature's gone up, now open a valve, et cetera. But the infrastructure layer, that could stay common if we had these sort of common APIs that then, you know, different applications can do things differently. So is that uh, one facet of EdgeX that you're currently working on? So with EdgeX, what we have is, uh, it's all like little microservices, and then we have something called a system management agent service, and it can tell you things like, I mean, it's a web service. I know we didn't ask for a web service, by the way, in this API, I didn't, okay? So coming back to that, it, it can like get you data about how's your CPU usage, how's your memory usage, is there enough resources on this node to maybe put another application. It can also start and re, uh, you know stop services. But that system management agent in its full entire functionality should be able to do a software update and you should be able to do things like configuration, like when, where, what, and maybe have like some mirror sites where you could go if you couldn't reach the main site. So, so like that. the IETF suit working group, which stands for software update for IOT, uh -huh. we're gonna call it the FUD working group, firmware update, um, but <laughs> there was some feeling that might be a problem. <laughs> um, but um, so the suit working group has a number of documents and architecture, uh, a manifest format, which is in CBOR signed with COSI, um, and I'm fighting against it, but the manifest is almost Turing complete, which is a bit of an issue. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit of concern, but because people have, you know, you have to upload, the, up, upgrade this, this ROM before you upgrade this ROM before you do this, and then this doesn't work, and so there's some complicated rules. But all of that kind of rules and, and criteria seem to be there. You should take a look. Maybe there's something that's missing. Okay. Uh, as I said, and it deals with the whole TPM, and is it signed properly, and does it go in the right places, and all the stuff it deals with this. There's a lot of very smart people in ARM in the UK that are working on reference implementations. There's a, uh, Wolf SSL has a reference implementation that I just heard about two days ago. Um, that runs on 
systems as small as the Zigbee boxes this fellow was talking about and as big as, <laughs> as, big as, as, as desktop computers, if you like. Um, so that's, that's all there. What we don't have very explicitly is a transport mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a bun fight, a bike shed, whatever you want to call it, okay? Everyone has different requirements for that. The, cool, the, the ability to, yes, move from one device to an adjacent device, well, you might need a protocol for that, but once it gets there, it's correct, all right? The biggest problem in general for the smaller devices is can I receive the whole firmware package uh, and store it without destroying my current running code? That's the biggest problem, and product marketing usually comes along and says, oh, no, we want all the flash for the new application, and then you're screwed. Right, mm -hmm. um, so that's the real. I would say the continuous fight that that we can't solve here or anywhere. And but and please so take so a look that at that. I think that I solves did. ninety yeah. percent of what you want. the 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 question is to how to apply it to um, larger quote Linux systems. Okay, meaning that have several megabytes. No, no, megabytes no. I like that is, it is, is it's question. general, and then if we can use it across the board for everything, that'll be perfect. And if all these other open source projects grow to it, then we have a common set of commands that we can execute, then I'd be happy. No, it's not a pro common set of commands. It's a common set of file formats and transports, because commands require authorization. Okay, okay. Fine. That, that's I the distinction I'm making very pedantically, yes. okay? But the point is that when to update is not something we can encode in a file True. format, and we're not trying to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's data, and this is the actual execution. So. Could we get some support for the commands then to be able to execute them and have one set of commands? Well, I would argue everything. it would want to be an API yes. with a set of commands that speak the API. But, you know, ultimately, it, it's certainly something worth discussing. And with who do we discuss? Uh, uh, it sounds to me like something that would really fit into the system D world of of there, um, and if not into that world, then you're if then you're into I think into very distro specific um, things, right? No, I want to say that the implementation should be maybe distro specific, but the actual API shouldn't. You could build your own distro with Yocto, and then just bundle that in with uh, Swift AG. <laughs> The problem is that you already have lots of distro-specific mechanisms that have all kinds of policies defined. And the risk that I'm seeing here is that you're defining a new command that is giving users the ability to specify all kinds of things that would actually violate already provided policies by tools such as Uyuni or you know what was formerly Spacewalk and what else um, solutions are out there. Also, when you're looking at that propagate parameter, I think that is uh, much too... Um, generic in this form as you will need much more closer control over what it is that you're actually applying which parameters to. Okay, I am ready to give up on my propagate for now. But even with your comment about, you know, many distros have their own implementation, um, with an API it's fine. You don't let somebody overwrite some thing. I mean, it's a, this is how it's solved and you guys can't do it. So that would then apply the, the last point on that slide, is that it would just throw a not implemented or some kind of error if someone were to Try specify something. a parameter yeah. that and, and if you haven't got an installation, I mean, of, of software update over there, and fine. But at least all the hooks are there. And my time is out. Yep. Well, done, and, and so next speaker, then I'm Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, then I'm not at fault. Thank you. We want to put this on Andreas. So this this screen on the left is a, an ether etherpad. 
If you're not familiar with Etherpad, you can, I don't know if you can read that URL up there, but this is actually editable by anybody in the room. Um, so if you can help me make sure we kind of fill in some of these gaps in the notes, like I'm also looking for individual speakers, we could do follow up with for questions, right? We, we want this to be a jumping off point, not like, this is not the be all end all of this discussion, right? This is jumping the start the of the cliff? discussion. Jumping off a cliff, sure. <laughs> but we all jump together, so it's okay. Land on, anyway, um, uh, so this is this this Etherpad. The intention is that anybody can edit this. We so just you know be nice. Um, we want to to add stuff here at the bottom. All this stuff should be kind of running with the timeline, so we can go back and look at video and compare against it. So I'm putting some timestamps in it. Um, there's other places. I mean, you can start new sections and kind of make sure different ideas or thoughts and things that didn't get spoken get summarized. Um, but let's let's let make this a good jumping off point for um, continuing this discussion and not make the discussion in here. And Drew's drawing the URL for us, which is good. It's, it's also on the main IoT schedule page. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Andreas Ferber. I'm going to speak about um, some work that I've been engaged in for a number of uh, wireless IoT technologies, in particular LoRa, lately also FSK. And I um, want to start by giving a bit of a high level overview and then diving in and out of technical details from time to time. So I hope you'll bear with that. So. Um, is a very quick tier model um, where you see like some temperature sensors on the far left of the picture that are sending data that are being received by gateways. Those gateways provide the data to some form of backend. Data gets stored somewhere and ultimately the data somehow gets uh, analyzed and has been received. Now um, I'm going to talk about this first part here, the blue wireless communication and uh, um, LP1 stands for low power wide area network, whereas WPAN is for wireless personal area network. And I found that the definitions of what is what have pretty much grown together these days. So um, I'm gonna get to which ones I'll be talking about shortly. Um, the characteristics um, are pretty much in the name. So low power means that uh, when we're thinking about like a very small microcontroller um, and if it's not sending a lot of data, like I don't know, maybe once a day, then it might last on battery lifetime up to 10 years. Some companies have even been thinking about, you know, like putting this sensors inside TAR to like detect whether a car is parked somewhere or not and then just forgetting about it at all. If you wanna have like a higher level Linux system, then that's probably not gonna be as long. And in particular, if you wanna um, send and receive data multiple times um, per day or per hour or whatever. Um, and then the last part, of course, is the wide area. Wide area, when you have line of sight, um, then it's gonna be up to 48 kilometers with the LoRa technology. In cities, of course, with, um, sorry, with obstructions in between, it's maybe up to 10 kilometers, but still uh, much longer than your average like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi connection that you would have um, at home. Um, and then finally, another aspect that has partially already been mentioned early on in this session is that for one, um, you have very small data packets. So um, we heard about eight bytes for temperature sensor. Um, Sigfox can do, I think, up to 12 bytes of data. LoRa up to 255, 56 bytes. So that's about the amount of data and because of regulatory restrictions, um, you cannot send arbitrarily um, sequences of uh, packets 
at least not on the same um, frequency. So there, um, you will be sending more data um, uplink than you will see downlink, but still don't get fooled by the dimension of these error in that that data is given an individual device, um, still relatively small, but it kind of adds up as you get towards um, <coughs> the back ends. Then another um, classification about those technologies is whether they are using licensed or unlicensed frequency spans in the radio spectrum. So I'm mainly going to focus on the ULPWA technologies for practical reasons that I can control both the sender and the receiver and I don't need to ask anyone's permission really to uh, work with those technologies. Um, and mainly um, the ones that I'm looking into are in the sub gigahertz range. So that's the 868 here in Europe. Um, in the US that's going to be the 915, Asia 923 and so on and so on. 470 is uh, China. Um, but lately also the LoRa technology has become available for 2.4 gigahertz. I do not have the range numbers for yet um, in my head right now, but it's going to be significantly less, but still um, the same technology is uh, being applied there. Um, by comparison that to like, you know, LTE technology, cell uh, mobile base stations is going to be the um, opposite of that where you have to, you know, um, have a telco that actually operates all the equipment and pays the government in order to do so. So jumping to LoRa 1 as the first um, primarily um, LP1 technology here. So this is the um, MAC layer technology where you're using um, a LoRa physical transmission format based on chirp spec spectrum. Um, and yes, the, the um, image is kind of a reference image so don't get um, frightened by all of that. Um, it's basically here the, the tier model again, just with some more details in that um, you transmit the data from sensors to some gateway. Gateway picks them up, forwards them to backend server. Network service they're called in this time and kind of split up by functions. And ultimately somewhere you can pick up the data that has been sent and do whatever you need to do with that. Um, and in this case, what you're seeing here in this magenta color is that with this technology, the vendor login is that there is exactly one company that is producing the chipsets that um, are the transceivers of this wireless technology. They patented it, but there's a lot of module vendors um, that are actually, you know, like making this available. So you do have choice um, in where you can buy it from and all the specs for um, how to access those chips are um, pretty much um, open and available. Um, Zigfox is the other big LP1 technology today. Um, for that, you have a company, one single company, that is actually operating all the infrastructure side of their technology. So you can um, have a choice of the actual chipset vendors that will provide the transceivers to use that technology, but you will be bound to buying a subscription from the company, Zigfox, in order to operate the data in terms of like, accessing what your um, sensors have actually sent. Um, the front ends again to that can be customized, but um, from the uh, like payment model, you are bound to a this single company. Like no. Kind of. So there are like some, I think, one year license if you buy certain evaluation kits. But yeah, I, I will not um, disagree with you here. Um, and then this one looks much greener, but don't get fooled to it. This is like the M. Um, Narrowband IoT, which is you know the new LTE standard that is being operated by telcos. So you have choice of telcos, but if you want to play with it, you need a SIM card. You need to have some form of subscription or access to actually um, using this service. Um, it's kind of easier for service, for, sorry, for software, in that it is being abstracted by an AT command layer. Um, so there's a lot of um, logic still in those modems, even if there are supposed to be less complex and less power hungry than a regular 4G, 5G modem. Um, and well, you are essentially then um, just tunneling UDP, IPv6 data from your um, end device to whatever service you want to get it to. There are exceptions to that rule that I've just made, but that is basically the um, rough picture. Now, the interesting part is going to be how do we actually, um, yes, and what I did not go into, there's like 
five more LP1 technology with uh, less distribution out there. So um, basically, chip vendors and service vendors are thinking about ways how, you, how can you optimize um, use cases for energy lifetime, particular data profiles, um, and you know, make money from that. So there is a lot of growth and movement in that area. Um, what I've drawn here is a bit biased towards the lower technology that I have been working on. Um, just to give a kind of a Lego picture of how all those technologies fit together and can be layered in theory. So in particular, as we've already seen in the one picture, based on top of LoRa, we can have LoRa 1. We can also do you know, our own stuff directly peer-to-peer -peer between modules. Um, similarly, we can also use LoRa 1 with an FSK modulation that was briefly shown in the uh, wild diagram before. And, uh, and the IETF has also recently been working on a draft called Static Context Header Compression, which is another of those IPv6-based um, technologies that can, among others, um, be used with LoRaWAN, also with Zigfox, and um, a few other technologies. I think NDIoT is going to be the other one. Andreas, I just had a quick question. Um, yes. So I, I, I think I'm, correct me if I'm mistaken, but LoRa is fully proprietary, right? Is that correct? Yes. So yes. there have been um, talks, I think, at, at Fostem, mm -hmm. going into the details of what people have been reverse engineering. But at least, if you, even if you know what it is, in theory, you, you may need to um, make payments to them. So is, there, is it not only their wire protocol that's proprietary, but also their modulation format? I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe <laughs> so. Yes. I like that answer. OK. Um, so basically, anything that goes into Linux kernel is fully reverse engineered and 100% community driven at this point, right? Is it? So, so put it this way: I believe that nothing that I have been working on in that area is falls into the category of being reverse engineered. This is following public documentation provided by the vendor on how to use like spy interfaces or UART interfaces in order to communicate with the necessary hardware. So I think the, what, what Andreas is saying, so what he's doing is like he's writing drivers for the ships and everything. So that is like completely free to be available. That's not a problem. So that's all inside the ship what they have. And what they also, I mean, there are other things that they might want to keep uh, secret source as well. But I mean, they have like the, the open LoRa spec that you can use for building like the application layer on top and stuff like that. So all these kind of pieces you can use without any big legal programs. Again, not a lawyer, but I think that's something we can use on a kernel perspective. But I mean, what we really want to do is like, we want to use the ships that are already there. We don't want to do our own FI, we don't want to do SDR. So some people might want to do that, and there are some, some talks about that and specifications that have been reverse engineered, but for our use case, that's not really a problem. Uh, no, I mean, no, no, the, the Semtex ships you can get are like really spy and everything. You can put everything, can put the Mac and stuff like that inside the, inside the kernel. So that is, that is not the problem. It's more like the FI, the things they have in there that have been reverse engineered. And that's something you can replicate with SDR or something like that. But that's something we are not supporting right now. Or at least that is what I, what I think. So yeah, I think you can, I, I'm going to use this, this question to, to say two things. So one is, the quest that I am on is to make the hardware that is actually out there accessible conveniently with Linux in a way that fits, I think also the topic that Peter is going to about, uh, talk to about to later, that it fits in with you know, the generic enterprise distros that we both work on and in the end are interested in um, having our customers be able to work with those technologies that they want to. Um, The uh, second thing here is that by using this color coding here, I've already implied some things here in that there are certain technologies that we can implement in the Linux kernel and some that we don't. And my interest here is enabling as much as we can, which would include um, having like a base file layer um, access in the Linux kernel that people could use to do a user space side implementation if they have the necessary permissions from the vendors that then, you know, does not involve us in any case. Um, and in other cases, um, be able to do, um, you know, like Mac implementations um, as we, um, as people run into needs to actually um, have them. So yeah, the, the orange ones are the ones where I see potential 
problems, depending on what exactly the orange ones would be like. By, by problems, you mean the orange ones, these are things that might need to live in user space, or that they have to, because at one point you were kind of drawing the distinction between what was kind of in the kernel and how to stay, or, or, and what's not, right? So am I? Yeah, so, so in particular problems what? for, so when a technology is, uh, Patented, then my understanding, again, not as a lawyer, is that we cannot just implement it in the GPLv2 Linux kernel. So for that reason, we would um, still be able to provide some form of socket interface that raw data can be put in and out, and where then the implementation of what like um, package formats they want to implement would then need to live outside of the Linux kernel. Yeah, and with that, I would directly dive into the more technical um, side of how actually to go about this. So um, I guess we have a very technical audience here at Plumbers today. So um, if you're writing a new Linux kernel driver for um, non-network subsystems, then usually you need some form of identifier like a um, device tree compatible string, a CPI ID, or you know, um, USB vendor product ID, so on and so on. Um, to uniquely identify your, your um, driver, you just plug it in as a module to an existing system and it starts doing something. Here with the network system, we kind of have a bit of a bottleneck in that we're going via one common oh. API yeah. and this needs to have like um, numeric identifiers that distinguish what kind of data we're actually dealing with. So we have um, a global number space of like address protocol families um, we have, you know, what we already have for the IoT space in here is Bluetooth and 802.15.4, as uh, I guess most of you know. And uh, we had been thinking about actually handling LoRa at the same level. However, based on previous discussions, um, we've lately been shifting that over to the more generic PF packet format, which then um, requires less boilerplate implementation in the Linux kernel. Um, unfortunately, it has one major drawback, and that is that you need to be um, you know, the root user, super user, in order to send such packets on that layer. Obviously, if you then have higher levels like LoRa 1 above that, that could be used as an explicit address family, would then give um, um, people still the possibility to do that communication over the same hardware on the higher level, but not um, on the lowest Isn't level. there a capability, though, for that? Um, I'm over here. Where is it? Oh. Isn't there a capability for that that would maybe mitigate that a bit? can set the capability for PF packet. Is there someone else in the room that I'm pretty sure there was, and maybe that, if there isn't, that would also mitigate things a bit for you. So that would be on the SE Linux layer, or? Um, that no, it's just capability? the capability. I didn't think you required SE Linux to have capabilities, did you? No, I didn't think so. Okay, yeah, so Lora 1 is definitely something that has been in the work um, by um, a, um, another volunteer in uh, Taiwan. Um, it's still a bit stuck because we need something underneath to go with that, either a module driver that fully then gets the um, implementation for Lua 1 itself, or um, the softmax layer that would then go beneath to the um, actual um, Zemtex chip layer then. And again here, um, I also mentioned like um, Zigfox as one technology that's here, the three DUMB ultra narrow band protocol um, that is um, being mentioned here. Um, another thing that I found quite restrictive is um, as someone that's uh, working on Linux distro um, is that we have this limit um, of uh, AF max, which is basically um, you know the um, last um, socket family that had been added to the Linux kernel. And um, in order to just you know, use an existing kernel and try out some of those technologies just by mod probing um, some code that I'm locally working on because you know, trying to avoid to do like a cross compiling kernel, deploying that to multiple systems just to find out whether you know, one line of code change actually made a difference or not. Um, I've then simply resorted to reusing existing unused um, numbers for testing purposes and just using like the official intended numbers when doing like a full um, cross compilation from a like Linux next base um, tree. Then um, getting back to the uh, PF packet topic, so um, for example, 802.15.4 uh, has its own um, packet type there, and we've started adding some for the technologies that we've been in touch for that is much less invasive than the address families. So um, we don't need to, to bump a max value for that one. 
and um, yeah, LoRa. Um, there is also uh, something called. Uh, oh, by the way, I think I didn't say that yet. LoRa is short for long range, and here then FLRC is fast long range coding. That's a technology that's being used in the um, 2.4 gigahertz uh, range by Zentech. Um, similarly, the other um, technology mentioned in the title was um, MSK, the frequency shift keying, which is a technology that's been around well. For, for ages is not really an LP1 technology, but come out um, connected to that topic. Um, and uh, yeah, there is then also all kinds of technologies that may be layered on top of them. And if we want to talk directly to um, a hard Mac module, then we may also need further um, concepts like that on it. So diving deeper into this topic, there is um, two main types of modules when dealing with LoRa. The one on the left um, is when we're just, you know, using the Zemtek chipset and talking to that directly by the SPI protocol mostly. Um, the alternative to that is vendors that are using some form of microcontroller that is inside using the um, Zemtek chipset and kind of wrapping that, which has the neat properties that um, we know from the data sheets, like what exactly are all the config fields that the transceiver sheet has. So uh, we can just simply go to the source and use those for all the uh, network interfaces that I'm going to get to in uh, a moment. The main use cases for Linux in this um, LP1 lower world, um, for one, if you have like a BeagleBone or Raspberry Pi or something, you can start prototyping quickly without having to code, you know, um, raw microcontroller code. Um, and yeah, you can just quickly send a packet and uh, see what effects that has on your network. Um, the, out and the, the other thing then is going to be like one level higher is to use it as a LoRa one client where Linux can abstract some of those um, join and different types of um, packets um, here. And ultimately the main use case that I see for the technology here is um, the gateway level, um, which are I guess to almost 100% running Linux um, and dealing with a lot more complexity both on the chip level and on the level of uh, software that follows behind for all the um, backend systems. Um, yes, this is a brief diagram that I keep showing how this uh, works with the software that you will find out there by vendors today. If you, you know, just get uh, software from GitHub, you will have like SpyDev or TTY devices that you then have to um, interact with directly and where I would like to get is a vendor independent interface, so therefore sockets um, that we can deal with um, sending, receiving and configuring packets and interfaces um, and have that like in one unified mainline kernel and user space packages um, be available generic in this shows without having to actually, you know, modify the code in order to fit for this vendor with this another vendor. Um, and while there's some more ideas out there of, you know, how to distribute that software, one is of course just to have like RPM dev packages that would be providing the software. Alternative is to use containers in one form or another for that. And I'm gonna speed up speaking a bit here to not uh, take away the whole um, break. So ultimately um, the main difference here is that we're gonna deal with um, socket buffers um, and with those um, buffers we'll also be able to deal with the higher level protocol layers that are not so easy to deal with uh, when you're using the um, vendor provided um, like SpyDev um, base code. Now I already mentioned Netlink um, a few minutes ago and um, one thing that's slightly ugly is that um, you're dealing with enums for um, both um, commands and attributes with Netlink interfaces which means that um, every implementation of Netlink needs to use their own list, even if pretty much every wireless technology, uh, m maybe not Wi-Fi, but many others are going to, you know, have like a frequency property of the center frequency that someone needs to specify. Um, in this case here, well, we don't have something that goes, you know, like Wi-Fi beyond four gigahertz. So for now, we're getting by with the U32, um, and basically, I've been trying to um, build. Um, those Netlink commands, uh, commands um, up in parallel for the technology so that they kind of, um, the naming at least uh, remains um, in sync. And if anyone, um, like for example here, um, 802.15.4 have ideas, I'm looking at a particular person for how we can actually share some of those things, then I would be very much um, 
interested in ideas, I don't know, maybe some C-level macros to <sighs> insert something into a list or so. But to be honest, yeah. right now I would consider that just as some kind of boilerplate code you would have. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not the nicest solution, but it's not really a, a big problem either. A at least that is my opinion on that. And you often have like really slight differences in meaning and how they're used in the end, so it might be sometimes problematic to share that. I mean, if, if you have something and you find some big enough area of code where you think that makes sense, send a patch and we can, we can look over that. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with that, but normally I would really consider that just it's a, another type of enum, some netlink boilerplate code, and that's it. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, one thing that I've try, kind of tried to indicate by the uppercasing here is so um, this part of the slide, there's um, always command set and command get in order to retrieve and set the corresponding field that is implemented at the moment um, in my private uh, GitHub tree, not yet in the uh, um, staging repository on kernel.org. And this part down here for that, um, I have, um, so I've started adopting the same thing that you have in 802.15.4, that you have this um, phi struct kind of as an abstraction, which then allows one driver to have multiple phi's for, you know, the, the various technologies that they implement. And uh, for the ones that are in lowercase down here, these ones are currently only exposed on the uh, um, phi layer with hooks, but not yet exposed as um, netlink command that still uh, needs to be implemented. And this is a kind of a picture of how this is supposed to fit together. So uh, we've been talking about sending raw LoRa data via um, PF packet down here. Um, we have to go along with that over here. The, um, by now it's called, uh, the module name is called uh, CFG LoRa, so config LoRa, and our LoRa is the, the file implementing it. Um, that would then be used to configure um, on that same layer, and then um, if we actually finally complete the soft Mac implementation for doing um, LoRa 1 on top of LoRa, then uh, we will need also the same thing um, up here in that we will need a separate Netlink interface to then do the operations on the um, LoRa 1 layer. Can I, two slides, think? Yeah. So yeah, and if you want to leave, then feel free to. I won't be offended. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, one ugly thing that came up, unfortunately, in advance of um, this talk is that at the moment, the concentrated drivers, which is the chipset that you will find in the gateways, which I said is probably going to be the main use case for using um, these, uh, f um, these, these drivers um, on Linux, they're unfortunately broke for the initial um, RFC that I had sent out, we were asked to adopt the RagMag interface back when we had like wrappers of our own around the spy um, commands. Um, we did do that and now uh, we had to implement um, FIFO support, so that's the RagMap write to no ink um, support for, for RagMap. Unfortunately, that is not working at the moment, so what we found just two days before this event is that when we actually bump the field max register up to like some really high value, then we can still upload um, the firmware and um, yeah, have things working as they were before again. Um, here's some things that I wanted to share that we had previously discussed at another conference. We were talking about what do we do when a driver actually has, sorry, when a chipset supports both a hard mag and a soft mag mode. Um, one idea was that we could just use a module parameter for um, controlling which of those we want to use. Um, and when we actually have multiple parallel technologies that could be used um, to use two distinct network devices and use the carrier up-down flag as opposed to the link up-down flag to indicate which one um, currently is in use to make it mutually um, exclusive. Um, we also felt that um, um, it does not need to stop us from going ahead with the lower technology that a lot of people are um, interested in if like one of those chipsets also has like a BLE mode and we have absolutely no clue at the moment yet how we can um, get that into the HCI framework and so on for the uh, blue stack. 
Um, and another um, pointer was to use the um, six low pan um, implementation that um, 802.54 has as a model for how to actually do a uh, lower one. And um, yes, this is um, mailing list, RC channel, previous materials um, that if you get the PDF, um, you can access. Unfortunately, not readable here. And um, yes, um, I have to skip over my test setup. Um, ben Witten of Laird had contributed some code. A number of vendors have provided hardware for allowing us to build up the interop setup where you know one node is sending data, others are um, receiving that. And uh, with that, I would skip to questions. Thank you for bearing with the uh, speed that I've gone into. Um, we've already had a number of questions, so who wants the queue? Behind you. So just, I mean, you mentioned the, the discussion we had at NetDev in the beginning of the year. So I think some of the more complex things you're describing here are something that um, can be common. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that. For example, the devices having like soft and hard Mac or uh, exposing like different modes and stuff like that. I really want to go with something really simple to begin with. Because um, just decide for a specific ship if you want to run it in soft Mac or hard Mac mode, for example. And then later on, this driver can be extended to have the other one. I just don't think too complex in the beginning. That is what I, I mean, I understand that you want to make sure that the whole setup you're um, bringing up there can handle all of these things. But sometimes this has to really develop over time because it's not possible to have all the answers in the beginning. At least that is what my experience I had from 15.4 work. Um, so you, you, it's, at some point you might think, find things that are not even used at all, so you can just stay out of the kernel all the time. Um, so and yeah, and for example, for the hard and soft Mac, the different things you have here. Um, normally I would go with the, with the soft Mac if you have that, but I yet have to see devices that actually have both of them. Do you have any examples for that or? Yes. Okay, good, okay. Um, okay, in that case, maybe you want to run that in hard Mac mode, um, and if you find that they are not behaving well enough, then you can switch to soft Mac or something. Um, I mean, I wouldn't do that in, on the driver level, just um, doing development, find out if it's hard or soft Mac or something. So that's what I would do at least. So, so two comments on that. So um, for one, the idea here was that um, we need to have like an API that scales to like every use cases that people may have out there, or let's say almost all, never say ever all. Um, but the focus so far has been on the core Zemtech chipsets with, I think we have maybe a dozen implementations around that like of, of drivers in whole where I'm trying to, and like when I'm you know doing, defining a, uh, New network operation try to make sure that it's you know like evenly getting added elsewhere where it's obvious how to, um, but still there is like a bit of a disparity where not everything is going to be like fully implemented from day on, but we need to to do a bit of focus. Then the second part is that I have taken the decision for now to go with the uh, um, with the soft Mac approach for the very simple reason that we do not have the LoRa one layer um, implemented complete enough to actually use that. So that provides us one way to actually send out data today. And in the end, it gives you more control. I mean, yes. it might be better for some specific products to have a hard Mac in the end, which is, be, which is completely fine. But from a software perspective, it's good to have a soft Mac around that you can actually debug and find out what's going on, what the problems are. And that is just impossible with hard Mac implementations. And you often don't get any updates for these, and you have to have all the quirks for that and so on. So that's why I often avoid these paths in the beginning. So, yeah. But I mean, just, just as a word about the process. I, I see you, at least that's my feeling, you're struggling a little bit with all the different things you have to handle here. You have LoRa, you have the different um, drivers, you have like LoRa van, you have all these different things. And you, at some point, you want to get that into the kernel. And I can tell you that it's would be very easy From if you the ground up is yeah. my strategy. Yeah, just make some, some really simple stuff in the beginning to get the things in and not try to throw everything. Because I mean, you the patch submissions we had earlier, I mean, code-wise that might, might be good, but the things is just too much to review, to look at, and to get integrated. So, yeah. yeah <laughs> you're not looking happy about that. But yeah, well, 
the, yeah, we'll put it this way, we'll take the discussion about how to get all the code that has accumulated in the staging tree into uh, you know, the NetDev tree at a, at a later point in time. No problem. I yeah. think that's out of scope for discussing here, no but yes, there, there will be challenges. It's already a lot of code and it's not even, um, not complete enough yet for an actual um, non-RFC submission. Questions, any questions? Well, question to the room. So I'm Peter Robinson. I work for Red Hat as their IoT lead at the Linux platform level. Um, one of the things that I spent a vast chunk of my time doing is IoT using Fedora. Um, and this is a bit of an overview and it's, a, it's partially designed to sort of throw a bit of a grenade into the room and get everyone discussing some of the problems we're seeing in the um, IoT space when trying to do it from a more generic distro point of view uh, at a lot more scale and some of the problems we're seeing. Um, so there's certainly been a lot of good improvements over the last few years, um, especially around things like standardized booting through U-boot, distro boot, UEFI, um, things like that, which certainly makes it a lot easier where we now have devices that you can actually just boot, generic Linux distros, and they will just work. Um, but there's one thing around enterprise IoT and industrial IT, it's not a Raspberry Pi. Um, and, and I'll get into some of this. There's, there's problems resulting around everything being focused on a single device and a single ecosystem, which the Linux kernel thinks they've fixed, but they've fixed like just a shim of it. Um, so some of the wireless issues we've been seeing and that are causing me a lot of problems over the last year or two, there's been no blues release for 15 months. You ask the maintainers and they're like, why do we need a release? Um, well, distros tend to rely on it so you can all work from the same thing and if there's a problem with Bluetooth, you can turn around and go, well, have you got the latest release of blues? The latest release is 15 months old. If you look back prior to 550 release, it was basically every quarter, boom, boom, boom. Pretty much four releases a year, not necessarily perfectly timed, but you could at least, if you were seeing a problem with a device, you could test it across a couple of different distros and you could work out where the problem was or you could collaborate with the distros and you could all be on one point. Blues is in a space now where there's like, over 500 commits since the last release, um, over 200 commits for Bluetooth Mesh, which is a relatively new thing that's useful for IoT, um, 130 commits with fixes, um, and it gets like things like bro uh, Broadcom and TI um, firmwares, like the firmware for the BeagleBone wireless is not upstream, so Bluetooth doesn't work out of the box and you've got to go and work out which Git repo it's hiding in um, and, it, and you don't know whether it's redistributable to go up into the Linux firmware or not. And so there's a lot of devices where Wi-Fi doesn't work out of the box. Um, a lot of the Broadcom Wi-Fi firmwares are probably vulnerable if you go and cross-read most of the Android CVEs without actually fixes. Um, and like a whole bunch of the Wi-Fi Raspberry Pi firmware for the Bluetooth, um, it kind of works with the on-chip firmware, but if you go and dig out the firmware from the Pi Foundation, you get much improved functionality, um, better mesh support, various other bits and pieces, but none of it's upstream. And you go and engage, and they're like, oh well, go and speak to Broadcom, and Broadcom's like, we don't own it anymore, go and speak to um, whoever the latest company, sorry? Yes, but Cyprus has just been bought by Infineon, maybe? And, and, and so you're in this situation where people are like, oh, it just doesn't work. And it's like, it works in Raspberry, and it's like, yeah, we don't have their lawyers. So, um, 
so I just want to be clear to understand you that the, 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 the firmware in the device that is that if you don't flash it has a CVE, there's yeah. updates to it, but those updates aren't in common distributions at this point. Correct. What you're saying. And also, like, the firmware that's in the device also doesn't get a proper Bluetooth Mac. Right. So, so it works, but it doesn't work as expected or as well as it should. Um, the firmware that's in Raspbian that the Pi Foundation's allowed to redistribute also supports Bluetooth 4.2, whereas the original one, I think, is 4.0. And so there's a bunch of improvements there around especially Bluetooth LE that makes IoT much more useful. So, so other fundamental thing is, is really closed source for, uh, binary blob firmwares yep. really pissing us off, yeah. Well, and, and like, you know, some of the TI or some variants of the TI Bluetooth is upstream and some of them aren't. And so it's like, is this device going to work? Well, let me roll a dice and find out. And and I'm sure there's like improvements. Um, Intel managed to, which is generally or used to be the best Wi-Fi. Um, Intel managed to regress the Wi-Fi between a Bluetooth update, a firmware update, a wireless firmware update, a bunch of random patches in the kernel where basically the wireless would just crash. Um, and it's mostly fixed now but if you've got a 4G modem in there, for some reason it still crashes. <laughs> and so, like, wireless used to seem like a fixed problem, but it's now causing me more problems than it ever has. Um, so, uh, sorry, I want to follow up on the Luzi side. So I'm wondering a bit about that because I see they're quite active still. I mean, I see, see they're picking up patches on, on the kernel side at least. Yeah. Picking up patches, sending pull requests. Well, and, and there's, there's fixes landing in the upstream Git repo, but there doesn't appear to be any release manager. And the only reaction you got is like, why they would, you need one? Because yep. I mean, I know that Marcel and then also with uh, Johan and so on, they always have been doing releases. Really well, and, and you know, yes, but there hasn't been a release in 15 months. And when I've asked and others have asked on the Blues IRC channel, they're like, why do we need one? And so you're now getting into situations where distros are taking Git snapshots, um, which means no one's on the same page, and you don't know whether things are like fixed in your version or not, or what version that, oh, look, it works in this distro. Oh, they're like rebased. So there's just no consistency across the board. And there's a whole lot of distros that are just going, oh, well, we're on the latest release, but there's been 15 months and 500 patches gone upstream since then. And so they're not rebasing because they're like, we want a tag release yeah. so we know where we're at. Okay. And like, I think, like, there's been other projects like the IWD project, and um, I know Johan does a lot on Zephyr now rather than necessarily the Linux. <laughs> and, and so they may have well moved on, but the Blues community or the Bluetooth community in Linux as a whole, they haven't said, we need a new maintainer because we don't have the time or the interest to do it anymore. Um, I don't know what the situation is there. I mean, I mean to be honest, I mean, Bluesy was lately really driven by by Intel employees. Sure. I mean that is. I mean it was working quite well. I mean, and I don't see that as a big problem. But you're right. I mean, a lot of them have been assigned to work on Zephyr. Even you see of like the 200 mesh patches. That is something that actually comes from the work they're doing on the Zephyr yep. side as well. And they want to have support on that on the Bluesy side. Um, so and I'm like Frank wondering about a release, I mean, I think that shouldn't be a big trouble for them to get that out. So I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, well, and, and like, if you go back through the IRC logs, every week there's at least one or two people asking about it. Um, and like, most of the time now, if I want stable Bluetooth and I want to deal with Bluetooth mesh, I actually, um, Nordic has these great little dongles where you can basically flash Zephyr onto it. And, and it basically just appears into Linux and you just basically offload it because it's much easier than doing it on Linux. Yeah. Um, and similarly, um, GPIO, um, my favorite Raspberry Pi device, um, like everyone says and like the GPIO maintainer was like, oh, Fedora doesn't enable the SysGPIO interface. And it's like, yes, because you asked me not to, when we were enabling it because you said it was deprecated. And there's libgpio 
IOD, which is fine if you're writing C and it has a sort of attempt at Python bindings, but if you want, like a lot of people want to be able to use it in Node-RED, but there's no Node.js bindings. Um, and things like the RPI GPIO Python bindings, which every project uses, doesn't support it. And the Pi Foundation is like, and the people around that, it's like, well, it works fine on the Raspberry Pi, yippee. Um, and so you get into a situation where Adafruit, any of the companies that are doing like GPIO based devices have these Python libraries that are completely dependent on the old interface and none of it works on the new interface. And the Linux guys are like, well, we have a library and it's like, well, there's no documentation, there's no good examples, there's no decent Python or other language bindings and it becomes a problem because I did what I was asked, disabled the deprecated interface and it's a lot more secure. Yeah, of course it's more secure because no one can use it. On that note, uh, I, I did a, a fair bit of research into GPO recently for the last couple of projects I'm working on and actually dialogued quite a bit with uh, Lena uh, who made the large change for GPO chip. And it's not only, it's not just that uh, the old API is very simple to use, it's that the new one introduces a bunch of paradigm shifts that people are not used to. And especially for uh, distributors who yep. just wanna get their hardware out there and you know, they're not, they don't really have that incentive yet to jump on the new kind of API paradigm well, bandwidth. Yeah, and, and like I feel that the people that are writing like libgpiod or something like that need to go, right, what are, what are the top 10 things that are using the sysgpio interface and go and help them convert over because it's, it, it's a bit like Python 3, like it took a huge amount of time because people are like, Python 2 is dying, migrate your code to Python 3, oh, but the 50 libraries that I need aren't there. And so it's like if they want it adopted, they've got to help do some of the heavy lifting. And like someone turned around and said to me, oh, well, why don't you write it? And I'm like, sure, I'll add it to the 5,000 other things that's currently on my to-do list. Um, and, and so it, it's, you know, I'm dealing with a whole bunch of other issues around IoT and I have people in the community just go, oh, well, I can't use this because, you know, it's, and I'm sure like the other distros have the same problem. In fact, I know the other distros have the same problem because I speak to them about it. And, you know, it, it's the same with the IIO, industrial IO interface. Um, And I just quickly add that there is even worse than the this GPIO that you were mentioning is that like some, um, at least some time ago, a uh, Raspberry Pi project were using this worrying file library, which is trying to do direct, um, what is it, dev mem access to yep. the GPIO controller and trying to toggle things directly. It may have some speed improvement, but it's definitely not a safe thing that we consider something that uh, we want to have done on our enterprise distro. Well, and, and like the worrying Pi individual is quite interesting because he actually just threw all his toys out of the pram the other day in a blog post because people were screaming at him because the Raspberry Pi 4 wasn't supported yet <laughs> and you know, add support for this extra hardware and why doesn't it work on this distro and stuff like that. And he basically just went, screw you all, I'm going. Um, and, and so, but like there's stuff like that where you're right, we don't want to touch it and I would prefer not to have to touch things like um, Sys GPIO because of the fact that, you know, it's nowhere near as secure as the new interface. But, like, I've managed in, like, two years of having it like that, one person implements stuff on it. And a whole bunch of customers that are, like, actual Red Hat customers that are amusingly and awesomely using Fedora IoT. And they're having, like, IoT hack fests and that, and, like, yeah, we can do this amount on Fedora, but we've switched back to Raspbian for this stuff because we, we can do this. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But, and, and like the industrial IO stuff, it's like, again, no user space bindings of note. Um, and you literally now have things like the UPM project. And if you go to like Adafruit or any of the companies that 
sell hats for the Raspberry Pi, it's all Python-based libraries that are implementing like temperature sensors, drivers in user space um, and basically bit banging the GPIO over sys GPIO. And you're just sitting there going, why would you do this? And, but you look and there's, and you speak to them about, oh, well, why aren't you using the industrial IO interface? Too hard. And so, um, the question is, how do we fix this as a community? Like, um, you know, there are a bunch of customers and partners and various other bits and pieces that are interested in it. I, I can't fix this myself. I mean, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, but I don't write a lot of Python and I don't write Node.js at all. Um, and I can vaguely sort of work my way around the kernel. Um, I call myself a Google kernel developer because I basically Google for stuff that's similar. Um, so it sounds like what, pi what person or combinations of people do you think would need to get together to make this effect solve this problem? Well, I think, so some of it, like from the firmware point of view, um, obviously that needs to be vendors and vendors actually need to give a shit. Um, and having had some conversation around the Broadcom firmware stuff where it ends up just being past the parcel between the lawyer, um, I'm not sure how we fix that. Um, it was my understanding there's like a Linux kernel policy that if you're Firm, uh, if your hardware needs firmware or your driver needs firmware, the firmware has to be in Linux firmware. But in a lot of cases, that's not the case. There's a number of media drivers that actually need firmware and they don't, the drivers don't work at all because none of the firmware for that hardware is in Linux firmware. Um, a bunch of the Bluetooth stuff, not in Linux firmware. Um, and so do we threaten to evict them from the kernel? Um, to turn around and say, you fix your shit, otherwise you boot it out. Is that a solution to the problem? I mean, it's probably a controversial one, but if Broadcom suddenly can't ship their wireless, um, they'll probably have some incentive to fix the problem, because at the moment I don't feel they do. I don't know. I've heard rumours of it. I mean, I think it would be a good policy, um, but I wasn't aware that there had been... Maybe it is for some, sub, for some subsystems, but not others. Yes, I'm not sure about that. As I said, it, 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 it's, it's basically hearsay from what I had heard, yeah, I mean, but it's, I don't believe it's documented anywhere either way. Yeah, I think that's exactly the point. We don't have any documentation that is, that is mandatory to do that. It's more like a subsystem maintainer saying, I need to test it somehow, make sure this firmware is available. And then you have to keep in mind that all the maintainers don't have the hardware sometimes. So they rely yep. on the driver writer or the company doing that to actually say that. And if they say everything is working fine because they have the firmware, that doesn't help you. Yeah. It, it, is, it is complicated. I don't know if the best way is to, to threat them to kick the drivers out. I no, mean, I I'm didn't say I thought yeah, it was no, the no, best I'm way. I'm, I'm just saying that it is, it's a, it is one option, definitely. But I don't think that's the best way. I mean, the situation you have with the Bluetooth drivers and the companies being bought by another company, and so on, that's like that's like real life that kicks in. Sorry, that's, yeah. uh, that's something that we can fix on a technical side. That's um, something legal stuff that is in the way. Um, but how do we encourage the, those companies to deal with the legal problem then? I mean, we, what we can do is like we can talk to the maintainers and the subsystem maintainers and talk to them and encourage them to make sure that the firmware is somewhere available. Most happily in, in Linux firmware, but if that's not possible, then at least somewhere on the, on the website they can actually test it. Yeah, because in a lot of cases, you're either in a sign this agreement to download this, or you're digging through Android dumps to try and find. Yeah, it, it should be something easier than these two options, definitely. Yeah. I think at one point, uh, Greg Cage was saying to regress drivers back into staging if they're not, uh, if, they, if they fail, if they, you know, yeah. if they're crashing. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, part of the issue, though, is firmware and not having any API into these firmware blobs at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, it's a proprietary silicon vendor thing, right? They want to keep their IP, but they also want it inside Linux, right? There, it's, a, it's a bit of a... Well, and, like, I understand, especially with regards to RF transmission and that, 
there is a bunch of laws around and they will, and their legal team will just go, I know it's mostly bullshit. But I mean, we have that for, for Bluetooth, we have that for, for wireless, I mean, yep. for uh, Wi-Fi. We have, I mean, that's not a problem we still have. We can, we can do that. Yeah, I, I realize that, but their legal teams will go, but they could change it and stuff like that. But, but you know, ultimately, <coughs> I, I, can, I don't like <coughs> binary blob firmware. I can live with binary blob firmware if it works. But if it, like, there's just so many cases where, you know, I flash a BeagleBone wireless and the Bluetooth doesn't work until I dig out the, the TI firmware from wherever it happens to be hiding. And you end up, like I literally in a lot of cases just end up Google searching the string that it's like can't load firmware X and you just Google search the string and you find out, you know, where the Beagle Bone guys have hidden their version of it. At some point I thought a viable solution would be for uh, if a company wants to get their device supported in the Linux kernel, then they have to sign a contract to either support it or contract out the support to an open source uh, software developer or something like that. I think that would be actually probably, you don't think so? No, I, I think it's, it's certainly one solution. And like in the ARM ecosystem space, in some cases, my, like the Fedora ARM project has managed to, in some cases, put enough pressure on some of the silicon vendors where they've actually got their stuff upstream because I've said I'm not touching it until it's upstream. A and they've, like, the Marvell stuff, there's a company or two, and I forget the name of the companies that are doing a lot of the Marvell stuff, but they went from absolutely, truly horrific to actually pretty damn good now. Um, and so, you know, some companies have gone, we're not good at this, so we will sign an NDA with another company where we can trust and just pay them a bunch of money to make our problem go away. But we don't want to have, like, from a technical community perspective, we don't want to get any way, anywhere this contract stuff or whatever. That can, the companies can do that. They can go to uh, a consulting company. They can go to, go to Red Hat or whatever. This group doing that for, for on their money. That, that's all fine. But we don't, on the technical side, we want to tell them, you bring the code in, you make it in a good quality, and we can maybe encourage them to make sure the firmware is available, Linux firmware and stuff like that. That's the level we can go but not going to legal stuff. That, at least that is my opinion on that. Yeah. Uh, as it, um, sitting on the vendor side, I said, yes, put it on the vendors. You, you say the firmware is not there. I wasn't aware that the firmware wasn't there in Linux firmware. You know, we got redistributable firmware. Um, that, was, that was the agreement we got when we got the, you chose to use the chipset, is that we got freely redistributable um, uh, firmware. So, right. so it should, it, then there's, no, there's nothing stopping us from putting in the Linux firmware. Awesome. I just didn't know it was there. Okay. So, um, you know, I think going back to the vendors and actually letting them know about the gaps and telling them about the, I love the idea of bumping it back to staging if it's not working. I don't know, why wouldn't, I mean. I fear that's not gonna work. So if I can quickly just say this, the problem is it's not as black and white as it may seem in this discussion. But the reality is that there is an existing driver that is working with some firmware on some device and then the vendor goes ahead and add support for the next family generation on top of that and may forget to tweak like some table so that it's actually loading the wrong firmware or just forgetting to take or has to it Or haven't sorted out to redistribute the new version of the firmware that's needed. Yeah. <laughs> and in some cases. This still goes back to like, the, if, if there's a regression, go back to the vendor. Yeah. You know, just. Basically, well, it, well, and then how do we fix some of like the only works on the Raspberry Pi bindings problem? I mean, one of the ways I am trying to fix that is we have a university outreach internship kind of program um, as part of research.redhat.com and we're starting to get some interns or people at university as part of their university project <coughs> able to do some of this stuff, but then having these in individuals that are able to start to look at some of the stuff, like they may be able to port like a few basic sort of like subsets of projects, but big things like the rpi.gpio stuff probably need quite a bit of interaction with the actual maintainers of like libgpiod. Um, and how do we get, and I'm sure, 
I'm sure Laura can probably comment on some of this and how best to make it work around things like outreachy and that. Um, but you know, I, it, it's I'm sh we have some mechanisms, but like the pe people or the companies, but like Lib uh, LibIIO, um, which is one of the more useful industrial IO, comes out of one of the big vendors that does huge amounts of sensors, but you hear nothing from them and they randomly do a release and they don't really appear to engage in the community at all. Um, so how do we get them to work with something like the universities to make this better? Um, and again, it's reach out to them, but like I've tried for a couple of people and not really ever got a response. So, um, and I can't fix this all on my own, hence like the questions. You started to go down um, the different things you can fix, and I, I got vendors down in my notes, um, but uh, I, I missed kind of, so the university project level stuff, like getting more people engaged doing. That, that's for things like, you know, what, things like uh, Python bindings for lib, and moving like, say the Adafruit project stuff, where they have a whole bunch of de devices and SPI screens and stuff like that that you can buy. Um, getting them working with new upstream bind, like l the libgpioD bindings once we have half decent um, Python or Node.js bindings is something that we could probably get university students to do. But there's a big chunk of work in the middle there that's missing that, you know, your average student that has maybe one semester to work on a project and may get a couple of bits and pieces converted over. And by the time they work out how to engage with the upstream community, and are mentored through that and get some patches written and some pull requests done that are ultimately accepted, um, that's, you'll probably get two or three things done and there's probably, a, you know, 500 pieces of hardware that need. Right. Right. I mean, because we, we just spent the last uh, GSOC um, trying to get a, a student to essentially kind of write a template for how you can add new I.O. devices very quickly um, to, to the kernel and get them working and loaded quickly under Graybus. Right. Um, and um, like in the in the time frame, wasn't really even to kind of create enough of a template to really get other students to be able to do the same thing, right? Yeah. You maybe got a third of the way through um, the template to be able to try to distribute this. So I, I know I don't have an easy solution to this because um, it's a fairly comp like complex coding problem. Yes. Um, and 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 that's about as like I, that's as much as I understand around a bunch of the academic stuff, and as much as a lot of the academic stuff is of personal interest to me, I just don't have time. Um, and I really need assistance there. So, sound to me, I was looking when you had that slide up at GPO, I, I don't know much about the API one way or the other, but I, I wondered to myself whether, you know, we could turn sys, sys GPIO into a, you know, Unix domain socket and stick a daemon in between that would do the right thing. I don't know, but that's where I was thinking like there. But it sounds like it, it's really, you say, because the paradigm shifts between, it's not just translating Well, yeah, someone in the audience said it's quite a paradigm yeah, shift. Yeah, so, so I, I don't know, but, but it sounds like the pushback has to be into, well, add a fruit, yeah. okay, um, to say, hey, you well, can and the hire Raspberry someone for Pi six Foundation, And the Raspberry Pi Foundation has basically went, it works for us, we don't give a shit. Well, well then maybe the kernel needs to, to stop just, def, uh, what, it's deprecated right now, maybe you should move it to staging. Yeah. Okay. And, and that would force the issue. Just to clarify real quick, uh, with Adafruit, Adafruit does care about libgpod. So the future for Python with Adafruit is Adafruit Blinka, which supports their circuit Python drivers under Linux. And they've now moved that to libgpod. In fact, they actually have a blog post about how um, uh, sysgpio is dead and long live libgpod. Lib We're getting uh, there. <laughs> Woohoo! But there is a lot of legacy stuff that needs to be and was that a recent, like when uh, did that happen? Within the, within the last year. Um, but one, one of the issues with that was that there's no pull-up support in libgpiod, um, so the, the new interface doesn't have pull-up support, so that was kind of one of the downsides. So and I know there was, there was some discussion about whether that should be in gpio or pin control, and then it got into like the weights. I'll tell a little anecdote. I, w I was uh, doing a workshop 
um, with some mechatronics students. So they're mostly mechanical engineers you know, doing computer science. And I'm espousing all the virtues of just using the Linux kernel as it is, and there's drivers for pretty much everything. Just use them. And then we grab a random example of an NFC tag, and the only code we could find working was an absolutely random Python library written on SpyDev. And that's been kind of the, the, the norm in this world. You just have people creating these crazy Python libraries using user space spy interfaces. Well, and, and, I, and, and we're not getting the code into the kernel. Well, and I find part of that is because there's like the libgpio stuff or the libio or whatever, there is not good documentation. And like libio, lib IIO, it's like, can I run up a Python web, weather station to talk to like a humidity and temperature sensor? Um, and is there examples for that? Well, not that I've managed to find on the internet yet. Um, and, and so... And, and that precisely is the point. If you Google for a specific chipset name, then you're much more likely to find some crappy example code you know, on, on GitHub for, for using SpyDev or some other microcontroller interface than a description for how can you actually get value out of using a specific sensor with the existing documented I.O. framework. Yeah. I think that's a point that people actually don't know that those things exist and are therefore not using it, and therefore not much work has contributed back. Well, or they go, they find, like, one of the things I love about the Raspberry Pi Foundation is they have all these amazing tutorials, and it's like, starts with pip and store rpi.gpio. And so, if it doesn't work with all those amazing lots of examples on any distro on the new interface, we've failed because nobody is going to go and rewrite that documentation to say, if you're on Raspbian, and do this, else do this, because it's like stuff gets out of date and things like that. So we need it to work in the same way from the end user point of view and then do the right thing under the covers for the new interface. And I think we're almost out of time for the next. So uh, just addressing the, the bindings issues in the conversion to uh, libgpi, the, in DRM subsystem at least, the way we get our to-do items done is we just have a very detailed to-do list with a point of contact. And, you know, every once in a while someone will come and pick one of those items off, but we also have outreachy students in Google Summer of Code. So even if they can't pick off the big items, Usually they'll stick around and you'll have indoctrinated someone into you know working on this and caring about it. And it sounds like really that's what you need. You need somebody to just dig in and, and care about it. So even if it seems like you might not get very far at first, you you know, you can make inroads. Yeah. So probably a to do list the would be the, what's the magic pill? <laughs> I <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's the first start, right? When people Google it, it would be great if your to-do list came up. Excellent. Thank you, everyone.
after you threw in some uh, profanity. No, no. Sometimes you have to do that to get your point across. <laughs> well, well, I joke, but the official name of the Raspberry Pi is the Raspberry Fucking Pi. <laughs> and I love to hate it, and I hate and to love it. Why? Okay, so we can go to the next. I mean, I only have a few slides, but this can save the time for the ending discussion. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm Stefan. Um, I'm the maintainer, or one of the maintainers of the 15.04 uh, Bluetooth subsystem, uh, subsystem, and I'm also working a little bit on the fixed low plan part. Just a little bit of an overview. I don't know how many of you are familiar with 15.04 and fixed low plan and so on, so a few of them, just to give you a brief idea of what I'm talking about here. So 15.04 um, is um, a wireless um, specification, a physical neck layer basically defined by the IEEE. The interesting part here is that it's um, only like 127 byte MTU, which is not uncommon in these kind of uh, protocols. But it gets really interesting if you want to run something like uh, TCP IP over it. Um, there's a series of ITF specifications um, trying to bring this forward. This is uh, what is six low plan called. So it's six um, IP version six over um, uh, low plan, basically. Um, the idea is to have like something like the like a sensor in your home sitting measuring the temperature somewhere and being that one being accessible over IP version six. So it can have direct address, you have routing solved, and all these kind of things that are you don't have to in invent again in your own network stack, which is a, a great idea. Um, so the basic around these ITF drafts are mostly around uh, address auto configuration, how you handle that for these kind of devices, how you do the frame encapsulation and uh, fragmentation, because you might need them because the MPU is so small. Um, and one of the key pieces here is the header compression, which is why Six Loping got so interested to other kind of specifications. By now, Bluetooth adopted it for their own IP version 6 over Bluetooth uh, transport. We have their drafts in ITF state, I think, for something like NFC. Um, then they're working on something like PLC for power line communication. There was one for um, extended Wi Fi range things. And basically, uh, at least five or ten more, I don't know, or I just missed. So basically, it's an adapt adaptation layer sitting between network and um, data link layer. So that's the green part, how you can see it here. So that's just a really brief overview of what's going on. So what I'm talking about here is the, um, the subsystem I maintain in the kernel, and what we have there at the, uh, the current state. So we have um, support for six, uh, six low pen with fragmentation and reassembly. Um, we have header compression for the IFC header compression, that's IPHC in ITVS speak, and the next header compression for something like UDP and other things. We have that implemented, it's upstream for a long time already. Um, we share these two pieces actually with the Bluetooth subsystem, they're using that. They're not using the fragmentation reassembly because that's specific to 15.04. They have their own um, setup for that. Um, we have a softmac implementation with various of drivers, I think we have like seven or eight different drivers by now, being able to drive like 12 or 13 different chips or so, so that's quite good. I mean, there are quite a few, not quite a few, there are a few that are not supported by now, but most of them are, and they are really simple on this guy. As a, as a total novice, I just want to ask a really stupid question right here. Sure. Uh, so when you, when you have these softmac drivers, where does the firmware live, right? So, so There's no firmware. So there's really That's no really firmware. The devices I'm talking about, most of the devices I'm talking about here are really, really simple devices. The PHY itself, and then SPI and GPIO access. To yeah, but the CC2520, is that, that so that one's an MCU list? There's no M4 on there? No, that's the 2520, that's the older version. So the 26 and so on, yes, these are bigger have, things. Yes, and then you have, uh, so you also, for CC you have always have to find the, there's the, um, the PHY ship itself, and then there's the PHY MCU combination. That could be something you can use as a network coprocessor or something where you have the Mac on the MCU side. Right. But that is something we are not supporting here. And, and there's also some um, things where you put an open moat um, on a serial bus and you speak to it with slip and all of the six low is on the in that side, in which case the firmware is open source. Okay, okay so Michael, yeah. 
So one of the things that is used quite often this kind of setup is the, the network coprocessor setup, like Michael just described. You have like your, um, your fly ship, and then you have your MCU where the, the Mac and all the other things are running on, and then you have something like Slip or whatever talk to the kernel. And that is something that is used quite heavily, and that is and, and, and part of the things that I've been trying to do is, is to move half of the soft Mac back into the kernel so that we can do things so that we, we don't, so that things can work uh, a little bit, bit more intelligently, but that's totally work in progress, right? Okay, I mean, just to get into that a little bit. So, I mean, there are valid use cases for that. For example, the, the Nest forks, so Google Nest, whatever um, they call it by now, um, they have the open set open thread implementation, which is basically using 15.4 as well. And when I talked to them, they explained to me that they want to have that on the microcontroller side because they have like, if you look at the products from Nest, they have like the, the thermostat and some, some of the smaller products. And the smaller products have like everything directly connecting to the, to the file that's not running Linux at all. But on the thermostat, they run Linux. But they want to have all the mesh communication for the 15.4 stuff running on a separate MCU to have Linux shut down at that point. So they can have all the things going on and not using the full Linux system there. So there are some valid use cases, but from a from Linux kernel developer perspective, we have no insight in whatever they are doing on that side. We can't use anything of that for our networking magic we might offer or not offer to them. So that is why we are not really supporting that that much in the in the current system because we have no personal interest in doing that. And and, and I'll, I'll say there's also some use cases. Um, where you need to be able to transmit at a very specific time because it's a time division channel hopping system and where we are we're not sufficiently uh, not saying we're not sufficiently hard real time our, 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 our real time response is not short enough for us to be able to do that at least as far as I think still have to be seen it's, it's on, my, be seen. It's on yeah. my list I mean it's on our list this yeah. is the preempt RT stuff and so on we might be able to handle things like um, automatic X and I could retransmit and we might be able to have something like beacons and so on. I really have to look into the timings and figure that out, but that's something really way down the list. Okay, just follow up here. So um, we have one situation where we have an USB dongle actually, which has an open source software uh, firmware, but that's something that was designed as uh, open hardware. It was designed from the ground up, so I'm maintaining the firmware as well as the driver. So that's something that's easy to do, that's the AT USB. AT USB um, is that one. That's like, um, yeah, I mean, there's one company that still sells them, so I have no connections to that, but. Um, they're, quite yeah. they're quite open, and I, I've talked to them. I think it's Werner. Uh, no, well, Werner designed it originally, okay. and um, then I talked to Harald, who is actually okay. now selling them with Sysmocom. Yeah. And I, the only reason I did it with Harald was like, they offered, they can do that, they don't make any money on that. I don't, maybe they even lose something, but they want to offer to the community. So. Even said if you're an existing open har open hardware company, you can, he'll license his USB ID to you if you wanted to. You don't have, it's, it's all free. You can just grab it and build it. I mean, I just had a hard time to find someone actually building new dongles. And I mean, because I was maintaining the firmware and the driver, I had an incentive to actually get someone to build them and sell them. So I was happy that Howard took that over. So they are now available again. So. Um, which makes it really convenient so that's the, the one point here to, to develop on your workstation or something with a USB dongle instead of going over a Raspberry Pi or whatever uh, embedded board you might have. We also have support for link layer security. Um, it, was, it was tested and developed by um, someone from Fraunhofer and they really had everything working on their side, but I have a hard time to actually get that really reproduced on, on my side. And, um, I have a, uh, later on, I have a slide in um, how you do like interop testing, also how you do that actually with all the embedded OS uh, things like Zephyr, Riot, Contiki, and so on. And uh, linked eye security is a problem there. Okay, so for future stuff we, we are missing, um, we touched on that already briefly. Um, so 15.4 has support for other things, um, not only data frames, but also beacon and Mac commands. So beacon is basically, you have like a, a periodic beacon and you have a time network basically, which is something we are not supporting and I don't really see much devices out there using it. There are definitely use cases, but I don't know if that really is something uh, Linux would support on our side. That's something we have to research. 
for the Mac commands, that would be something like having a coordinator and do scanning and stuff like that. That's something Chris actually started to work on. He, owes, he still owes me a pull request for that. So I will make that as soon as I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So that is something we are not supporting right now because it's not really needed for six low pen because we can do easily the six low pen um, and a static configuration. Um, but for a real full featured network you want to deploy something like uh, scanning and a coordinator and stuff like that will make it a lot easier to handle. So just to add that the, the real killer space is that the gateway box that would connect the 15.4 to the rest of the world is probably a Linux machine and hopefully not an RPI, but, you know. It will be fine, I mean. Well, well, just there are other opinions about the quality of them for industrial uses. But the point is that, that that's, that's where it's being used, and what's happening right now is that uh, people use a Linux machine, and then they boot um, one of the other embedded operating systems on it, and essentially, uh, sorry, at, as a process. So they run the, uh, the gateway as a, another operating system compiled as a process, which is kind of sucky from a... So is Linux. there a good documentation as a Linux user how you would get this up and running somewhere? Nope, nope. What part? I mean... What, what uh, no, part? like, if I wanted to use just Linux and plug in one of those devices and yeah, that, that get a gateway up and running... I mean, we don't have not, a gateway. Not, not for the gateway, yeah. I mean... So what I focus on here, there's no sense of gateway or whatever. I'm really, we are basically just coming up to the routing part and stuff like that. So I'm really coming from the ground up here. Um, so something like that is normally driven by a company because they want to have their own specific stuff or something. And that's nothing really uh, interesting enough for me to actually look at. So for example, what I know from, from Nest and so on is that they are having like their own stuff there. Um, and, but they're deploying a whole setup, a whole system and everything. And they have no big incentive to, to have all of that in upstream Linux, which is fine. I mean, I'm not really bothering them about that. I just, from my perspective, it doesn't have any interest for me because I can't look into that. I mean, all the stuff is open source, all the open sweat stuff and so on. But as long as I can't really feed it back into the networking stack from Linux, it doesn't really matter to me. So who was that company or the project? O oh, the, like, thread. sorry, the open thread stuff. Open thread. Yeah, yeah. That would be one part. I mean, they, they, before they had their own thread implementations that are proprietary, but now with OpenThread, they moved over there. And, and there's a lot of things beyond OpenThread that, that um, sorry, beyond Thread that is using 15.4 yep. that is not at all intended to be at all compatible with, with Thread um, for a lot of other scenarios and situations where it would be really nice to have uh, things yeah. that, that would work well. I mean, most famous Zigbee. I mean, everybody knows Zigbee, but nobody knows that it's actually based on 15.4. So um, they basically used it on the, on the file stuff itself, but nowadays they have like Zigbee IP, which is actually based on 6 open. Mm -hmm. So that could be interesting. It is problematic for us to actually deal with them because it's their legal stuff on their documentation side. So, for, so I don't really touch anything of that. But as long as they do whatever using Zigbee IP their profiles over six low perm. They can do that by now. That, that as a, I mean, there's a lot of things that will be missing, but they could do it actually on a company side. And then could it have been user space without any legal objective? Catwalk? Um, is there anyone that is doing that on the non six low perm layer in user space? For Zigbee? Uh, nobody talked to me about that. Maybe they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> I don't know. Or do you mean Bluetooth or something? No, I meant uh, 802.15.4. Okay. Okay, so I'll keep going here. So one of the other things we are missing, which is basically mostly due to lack on resources on, on our side, is like having support for hard Mac transceivers. We have one which is really kind of ugly fit into the soft Mac to make it work. Um, and we are really need to ramp up our, our side on the infrastructure to make that possible. But it's quite a lot of work and I only do that in my spare time and the other maintainers also doing that in spare time. It's the usual problem, basically. Um, we also started on neighbor discovery optimizations. That's something um, which is a bit more complicated because it touches quite of other things in the core networking stack, which is a bit sensitive to get stuff into um, because you have to make a lot more um, effort actually to make sure nothing else breaks and you're not uh, regressing in performance and stuff like that. So that's just more work, basically. 
Um, we have all the various header compressions already in there. What is really missing is a configuration interface, um, something with netlink, and then define what is enabled to what peer you want to connect with what compression enabled and so on. I talked about that for a while already, um, but yeah, just didn't really work on it. And then there are these things that we get into the next level with, with something like routing and stuff like that. We can have like root over or mesh under protocols and we need to support them on, uh, from the kernel subsystem side with actually giving them the details and the properties they need to know. Actually, there was a patch coming in which has like AQI value already in the, um, in the send method or receive method thing, so you can actually get that back and then in user space you can actually deal with that and make decisions for routing and stuff like that. We have uh, Armstrong from Michael who actually um, worked on that as an RPL uh, daemon. Then Alexander just two weeks ago released RPLD um, and we need to work with both of them to actually understand what kind of support they still need from the kernel side to, to give them the needed properties. And who's that? What do you mean with um... uh, uh, RPL is like is a route, routing for uh, lossy networks. Um, so and that is defined by ITF as well. So Michael was the, was the lead for that for a while and he was uh, doing the unstrong thing. It's root mesh over. So, so layer three mesh rather than layer two mesh. Does that make sense, Chris? Did you understand? Yeah. Okay. okay. So that is the this website. And yeah, so as one of the last slides to kick in, it's like as a comparison to all of the other things we have in the IoT space. So as Mike mentioned, we have like, if you consider Linux being the gateway here, we have a lot of other small, really tiny things available and they are not going to run Linux, definitely not. So and then you have things like Riot, Kentucky, Zephyr, OpenSwap. Um, there are more. There's uh, Embed from ARM for a while. They had like the networking stack closed. I think that opened up by now and you can actually look at the source code for their six load time support and so on. But I'm not 100% sure. So that's just a comparison table of what is support and what not. And as you can see, for example, the Beacon Mac command frames here, that it's not um, only Linux not supporting them, Contiki and Riot neither, because it was easy enough to just bring that up statically, configure everything. But for a real deployment, that's a no-go, basically. Linked to security, I, I briefly mentioned that. Um, so we tested against Contiki, and the front of our people also tested against Contiki. Um, so that is kind of working. Riot doesn't even have support for that. Maybe that's outdated, I need to check on that. Um, I never personally tested against that fire or threat. So the linked line security stuff we have in here, but I'm not 100% sure that everything is working as good as it should. Just so. a question on the linked layer security. Um, I know that for the longest time from the, in the Zigbee uh, crowd, there was just nobody actually dealt with security at all. Um, and because there was this known uh, yeah, so key. I, yeah. Issue. Are you aware of that? Well, issue? the known key issue. Yeah. Is, okay, that's implementation uh, implementation stuff. So what they did, they have like this Zigbee Lightning um, uh, protocol where you can just uh, turn yeah. lights on and off, yeah, yeah. and they hard coded the uh, key inside the devices and told every vendor you don't have to tell anybody. Well, what a surprise it came out. Um, so, but that's an implementation detail on the outside. So on 15.04 side, they don't really do anything on key handling, rollover, whatever. They only say you have like a AS key sitting in here this length and you can put that in the hardware. That is also a blocker, right? It's not used in all the homemade protocols and so on because it's quite difficult to get right. I know that uh, Sweat is actually doing it. So Sweat is using uh, link layer security on all of these things. It, it's mandatory for them to do that. So. There was, this might be a uh, higher level thing, uh, but there was a rejoin uh, vulnerability as well with Zigbee. Uh, is that 802.15.4 or is it just Zigbee? I don't know. You don't know, okay. No idea it turned out. Yeah, and, uh, me, if you look at all the other things, you see that the, uh, the basic six low pen stuff is supported in all of them. The header compression is also supported. Um, yeah, next header as well. There's a thing called generic header compression which is not supported for any of them. I looked into that. It is interesting because it uses like a more generic uh, compression style instead of all the other ones are really relying heavily on the fact that they know about the context, what is available, the, the underlying MAC address and stuff like that. So, um, and uh, generic head compression doesn't do that, but they still have something that is cheap enough to actually run on these really tiny uh, uh, MCUs with like a coin cell battery and so on but nobody really implemented that. A, a big benefit would be for like 
protocols which have like IP addresses in there as well, like Ripple or like DTLF or something like that, where you have like the IP address again inside the header or something like that. But yeah, nobody had that. Um, Labor discovery optimization, that's something Riot has been working on. We tried to work on it and the other ones in various stages there. And yeah, Ripple, um, as I said, we have like Armstrong and now uh, Ripple D. Um, all the other ones are more like really tightly integrated systems. So what we have only clone space and have different things like different projects and user space is different for Riot contiguous one. They have it all in one box. Yeah, and mesh link establishment, that's something that is really specific to Thread and that's only supported by OpenSwread and we forward of that to Sapphire. So that's just an overview of what, what's available, of how compatible, compatible we are with these kind of things and so on. So are there more questions, rantings? <laughs> yeah, so as I said, off the floor, yours. Um, I was just gonna say, is uh, it's been a number of years since I was active in 15.4, so mm. uh, probably six years. Um, it could be around the time after it merged mainline. It was like 2012, it was yeah. merged mainline, so. So uh, at that point, it was quite active. Um, and I'm just wondering, is 15.4 still, uh, does it still have a lot of momentum? Are people starting to lean more towards VLE, especially with yeah. VLE mesh coming so out? So I, I think it, the movement is more towards VLE mesh and stuff like that. The problem is to get momentum behind that um, without any real use cases that uh, either a user at home would do or a company would do. I mean, the big use case for Fiction 4 have been Zigbee, and nowadays there is threat. So that was one of the reasons why I've been talking to them so much, because I was hoping that they could like find a good way that we both could work on something that is actually interesting. Um, but that didn't really work out well. So. Partly, I think that's also to blame on our side because we are not making enough like PR about it, bring it out, bring new stuff out. But it's, as I said, the time is limited on what I can do on that. And um, yeah, so uh, we are, are making progress. Are you asking about the Linux activity or are you asking about the industry activity? Uh, I was, I meant Linux activity and spe okay. specifically, but I, just out of curiosity, I, I assume that, I know that you, as you mentioned, there was Zigbee IP um, is that gaining any traction? No. Oh. <laughs> Zigbee IP, Zigbee is, is not going very many places very quickly, um, but 15.4 in industrial IoT is uh, growing, but it's very um, well hidden mm -hmm. because um, it's very vertically integrated under trade names. Right? Yeah, so there's a wireless heart, wireless heart protocol there that keeps on coming up in certain industries like oil and gas where I have various conversations with large companies. Yeah, um, there's, right. there's, and, there's and more wireless there. Heart is, is an example of just interested, is a example of 15.4 with a mesh under. So it's layer two mesh rather than layer three. And if I'm correctly, right. wireless Heart is also beacon enabled. So you would have like timing requirements, which yep. is interesting yes. for industrial IO, but complicated on the Linux side. Right. So, I mean, that is, as I said, it's on and my I'm agenda to actually figure out what we can do there. But it would be good to have more use cases from the industry to see if we can actually serve them with what we have right now, or if you can serve, serve it at all. Because I mean, if you are not able to make the timing requirement they need, then we can we can offer them anything. Well, well, and I believe the wireless heart stuff is mostly open as far as I could tell, but I couldn't actually find a open source implementation of it. Um, but I'll ha I can quite happily chat with you about that afterwards because I know a number of companies uh, no, <laughs> wireless H-A-R-T. I put a note about it further up. I mean, it's yeah. also in the, in the big slides I uploaded. So that's really the reduced set to like five slides. Yep. The one, the big one I uploaded to the site has wireless heart mentioned as well. So there's, there's more so, in there. So it's likely if you live in, in the US or Canada that your electric, smart electric meter is 15.4. It's unfortunately unlikely that it's encrypted, even though the, <laughs> um, even though if you ask your utility, they will swear they RFP'd encrypted systems, but it's evidence is the vendors didn't really do that and no one checked. Um, uh, but, and the water meters are the one, are also from what I can see, they have the 20 year batteries and they wake up once a day or less. Um, and those seem to be, uh, they may not be IP, but they're 15.4. 
So yeah, why sun is it for the metering is the space, and many of those are using 15 for the G5, which means they get a 2K packet, which is luxurious, right? Yes, there's also something I didn't say they in have the power. beginning. Yeah, they, they are extension to like the 127 byte. That's the original MPU size. There are extension to the specification for that. Okay, so yeah, yeah. time's over. Uh, so thank you. If there's any burning questions, just take them one more, and then um, okay. we're going to need somebody to take notes for us. We're abandoning yeah, the health safety yeah. consultants. So um, okay. again, we actually prepared an issue that in the computer, uh, oh. any computer for the purpose yeah. of this as well. So just a one hour. Oh. Last, last question for uh, Stefan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, test, test, one, two, three. Okay. So I'm, I'm Jason Kreidner. I'm a co-founder of BeagleBoard.org. Um, and Rufus Dini serves on the board with me. And then um, Chris Freet is uh, here. We were the organizers of this uh, micro-conference. Um, but we want to talk about some of the ideas that we were trying to, to, to pull together to try to um, improve IoT and IO and the, the software development experience for this. And we feel like Graybus is like, you know, if there ever was a silver bullet, it, you know, it's, you, you hate to declare, you know, um, something like that, but, the, oh. Well, that you, you, you gotta plug in first, right? Uh, the, yeah, for the Etherpad, just just go to the just go to the URL. It's not going to be showing. So 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 Graybus is a a bit of a, a silver bullet, um, and um, you know, we'll argue that uh, you know uh, you know in the future. Um, but um, you know. You look at something like USB subsystem, everything works you know, magically, right? You connect a device, um, you interrogate the device from your host, you ask it what it is, the device tells it what it is, and lo and behold, it just works. And if you look at all the crazy fun stuff that all of the IoT sensors actually use, there are things like I2C and SPI and GPIO and all these non-discoverable buses and all these things that we have to suffer with device tree because of. Um, yeah, if, if, if Frank would just give it to me, and the, overla the, the overlays and the kernel, dynamic overlays in the kernel, my life would be so much better. Um, well, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, he's not giving me that. <laughs> so um, we don't have dynamic device tree overlays. We have no way to figure out what's there. Um, and so you're just kind of, you're, you're stuck, right? And Graybus Alt makes this, this problem magically go away um, because Graybus now gives me probable, discoverable buses um, for embedded peripherals, right? So I've, I'm imagining a couple of microcontrollers in there. You talk to them over some mechanism. I have it drawn as a UART that really doesn't really matter. Um, and you don't even necessarily need a microcontroller in that. but. On the other side, you've got a microcontroller that's going out and actually talking to those physical bus, buses. You connect a device, you probe what it is, it sends a manifest file, and boom, it just works, right? 
it's all that simple. E effectively, and, and in, a, in a more secure way, right? So, because it limits you to what buses you're doing, right? So you can only load certain drivers, yeah. Right, so, so, so Graybus is going to give you device tree overlays, but in a secure way, limited to particular buses, and now the other magic is it, it makes the transport of those buses arbitrary, right? So you can send it across TCP IP, um, as Xander was showing earlier, um, you can, you, so it doesn't matter how you hook it up, right? So does it, it make sense to you that if you're not going over something remote, like it's if it's in on the sock? No. It, does but, it make but, sense but, to use it even but, if it's on the same SOC? Right, but it's not discoverable. Um, yes. So, so we do have an example of we where we do just on the same board where it actually is useful. <laughs> in the the use counter case. is, you know, I want to use device tree overlays. So well, if I, I can't use device tree overlays, do we use Graybus for things like this? I think that the next thing that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Well, I, I, the next thing we're going to talk about is the fact that um, it's kind of unfortunate right now that you are you have a fixed device tree when you boot up. Since we're doing overlays in the bootloader, um, infrared rapid prototyping that can be annoying. So Graybus actually running on the local system is uh, one solution for that. And I think what we're going to talk about next is our Google well, Summer of Code student. Or well, now we actually yeah. have some more slides before we get to that. We can jump ahead to it, though. We'll come back to the experience. Um, uh, you know what? I'm not going to. Yeah, don't, because don't this, is, this is really kind of putting forward the case. But we'll, we'll get, we will get to the, the GVSIM-based implementation, right? So we're, we're, this is, this is what, what we're um, imagining and implementing is kind of as being the experience for something. So here we've, we've made the transport wireless, right? So um, whatever the wireless is, right, we've got you know, IP transport, so we can now make it wireless. We have a Linux box, right? Represented as a, a, a small um, open source, har open hardware Linux computer with uh, some wireless gateway information, right? You're using just you know Linux command line, um, and you've got a, a, a Linux gateway and a small microcontroller-based device um, with IoT sensors in it, right? And so the experience is you tell them to connect to each other. Um, you know, physical proximity buttons, somehow you make this connection securely um, so that you know that this guy wants to trust him and he wants to trust him and we're all happy and glorious and um, they just connect. Um, the, the device, the sensors, describes itself uh, to the Linux computer and bam, it's probably hard to read this writing from the back, but an, a new IIO um, device has been, been um, instantiated just because we said there's one out there and we trust it and now all the files are there. We have, you can use libIIO to now talk to it reliably and it's self-describing uh, um, all those wonderful things and you know, it just works in, in, in Peter's distros and um, you know. It, anyway, this is, this is the idea, right? This is, this is what I think the gray bus magic can, 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 can give to us. So, right, so thank you Google for you know, paying whatever they did for <laughs> getting that developed, and then not making the phones. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but, but they can't replace the processor, right? You can only add on the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, so, so there's this, you get you know, all these non-discoverable buses that are automatic uh, provisioning, but all of this crazy, ugly user space hack Python drivers Right. This to me is the real value proposition: is that, that we just we got to make a simpler way to solve those end user problems. Right. So that it's not easiest to just Google random SPI, you know, Python spy dev driver. Right. But it's going to be a simpler experience, and and you know because the code lives in the Linux kernel, there's no need to write code on a microcontroller and then try to figure out where to paste your code into their cut and paste code to try to change how you're gonna move that data around, right? It's just using a standard device driver model in maintained code, one place to find it, right? Linus Torvald's tree, right? V1, and it, you know, it just works. Um, maintenance, right? It's actually maintained. You have a place to send bugs, right? We have a process for, for getting fixes. Um, and for, for a lot of users, um, that just want to write their Python code, let them just write their Python code 
it's, it's going to be independent of the actual sensor that they're using, right? If they're using accelerometer data, they use the I.O. interfaces for accelerometer data, and they don't have to worry about the specifics of the um, particular accelerometer they're using, right? They just need to pick the right one for their application. Um, what am I missing here? Well, and then also the remote node that you don't have to do any development of the microcontroller firmware. All right, so write it once, right? So there's one, so does, nobody has to learn how to write random new microcontroller firmware. What if there is a bug on the microcontroller firmware? Well, it'll be open source and you fix it. Oh, yeah, that's great, okay. <laughs> so maybe a, like a compatibility test suite would be a, gr a good idea to you know, keep maintain a list of devices, yeah? I think that'd be fantastic working with them an open source operating system and, and having a, a, a test suite where we can test across. Yeah. I guess the point is that the, lin the developer on the Linux system doesn't need to do microcontroller firmware development because the, micro the remote microcontroller node is presenting itself over Graybus and de describing what it has, right? So like you're implementing it in Zephyr, um, but like I'm, if I'm using the system, I don't care about that. It just, it's a remote node that is presenting itself over Graybus. Um, yeah, um, so we're specifically looking at, at um, kind of a, 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 a pin header standard, because there's I'm not, standard is such a loose term in all the, so many contexts. But, um, but there's this, these things called, uh, so Microelectronica, a um, company out of Eastern Europe, has built just this, this huge library of, of these sensor boards they call, call click boards, right? So, um, sensors, actuators, um, and the, the kind of magic is that they didn't limit their pin interface to just like four wires and you don't just have like, you know, choose, you, you have one of I squared C or SPI or, or, or um, whatnot. Um, and, and they didn't like make their so form factor so small that they couldn't fit a good amount of stuff onto a board. Um, and they've, they've managed to figure out how to just crank these boards out. Um, they get them in pretty broad distribution. Um, you know, there's, I think there are over 700 of their boards, right? I think they put out another, like, one or two a week or more of these, these boards, right? So you could probably find um, the, the chip, the sensor chip that you want to play with in their library. And if not, um, it's not so hard to actually go and make your own because they give you all the standard stuff that you want to work with, right? So they give you the SPI bus, they give you UART, they give you I squared C. Um, reset and interrupt, they give you an analog pin, um, PWM output pins, right? So it's kind of got all the fun embedded stuff on a little one inch square interface that can extend out for extra stuff if you need it. So they kind of figured out the right stuff um, to, to put on here. Um, so rather than trying to, to reinvent it and make yet another, you know, pie hat, beagle bone cape, you know, sort of thing, it's just Pick something small and simple that just works. Um, so I think this this allows us to kind of slide, where's the other side? Oh, the slides are slides are hidden. What's going on here? Um, no, maybe that's just where we jumped. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I kind of threw myself off by thinking I had some other slides here, but um, this, this easy enough to work with the the, the, the microbus. Um, stuff. This is our, our Google Summer of Code stuff there. So um, a part of this is you would, can easily plug in different modules, and when you're plugging in different modules, um, I mean, right now what you'd have to do is you have to go in and set the overlays in the bootloader, and uh, our Google Summer of Code student thought that was somewhat um, broke, broke the rapid prototyping flow for him, so he thought of a way of using um, Graybus and GBSIM to have this workflow for uh, when you insert click modules in. So he wrote a, a, a Python script called uh, insclick, um, which he had a little a set of uh, uh, JavaScript object notation um, kind of entries for the different sets of, of clicks um, that included a, um, some, 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 some templated uh, um, manifest, so Graybus manifest, right? So that it says, okay, I've, you know, I've got an I squared C device, um, you know, connected up, and, and I'm just going to kind of replace what the device name is. Um, 
So he created, a, he's got a way to kind of add in JavaScript object notation a new board entry for one of these new, new clicks. Um, you run this Python script, um, it's a int click, um, and it uses, utilizes um, gbsim to instantiate that. So this is a, a simulator that was written to test the hardware interfaces um, for, for Graybus. And so this already runs on the BeagleBomb Black, um, and he got it to work on Pocket Beagle as well. Um, so this just uses, implementation-wise, it's just using that the spy dev and I2T dev uh, interfaces and user space, um, but it's presenting itself back to the kernel through Graybus. Um, and so all of that becomes like, you know, um, self-describing probable hardware that gets um, loaded automatically through the int-click interface. Um, and so now we, using standard stuff, um, you were able to dynamically load drivers, um, you know, connect it up. You just say which of the different click ports you're connecting up to and which click you're installing, and um, boom, creates the interfaces. Um, and e even in his database, he's got some extra descriptors um, to kind of tell you where the I.O. interfaces show up for the different devices. Um, this is all, this is, this is a pretty fun, project for him. He even went to the next level of getting it to work in like a Microsoft Make code um, where you, you, know, you could just drag and drop the click that you wanted to load um, the drivers for and then the, the, the data would show up and you could use it. And of course it's really easy to see how to extend that um, to um, Node Red, for example. And, that, and that's sort of the, the developer environment we see is like you just see the different list of the devices that you want data from, grab them, and here comes the data, and then you can publish it through MQTT or whatever else you want to do to, um, to, to work with your data. And this brought back like the runtime flexibility that we had with the Cape Manager, which we've lost now that we do everything in U-Boot. Yeah, Frank. So um, uh, I had two thoughts, but I wanted to under make sure I understand the click story right. Um, is, the, is, is there an MCU that would return the, ma the manifest, or what, how is that? That's just because we have manifests on our local. Something like this. So something like this, running a little microcontroller. Right. So yeah, this, this is what we're using to, to do our, our prototyping. Is, um, so there's a little, um, it's a CC1352. Um, sub gigahertz and BLE um, um, enabled microcontroller, um, and this is running Zephyr. Um, so there, so this, um, yeah, this has the. So that would be a thing that you would talk to over, over IP or Bluetooth or something. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. So I understand that 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 part well um, now. Um, so then my other question is: Do you think that we could find a way to get manifests from other kinds of? you know, daughter card systems, whatever the names are these days. Um, like you can, I can imagine someone, you put a small E squared prom on an SPI bus. Sorry, I2C lets us have multi-drop, right? Yes. Um, so an <laughs> I2C bus and all of your pie hats or whatever they're called could actually self-describe themselves that way in that manifest. It, the, the, so the thing is, is if the, um, the sensors are connected up to the bus of the, 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 the Pi itself, then you would need something like GBSIM still implemented in order to do the, the resource mapping, right? So, right. Um, so it, 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 yes, you could do that. Um, but the far more interesting, I think, ultimate use case is having a small affordable thing that looks a little bit like this and connecting that up to your Raspberry Pi wirelessly and well, I, I actually have severe doubts about that part. Okay. 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 So, or, so, or so that's a that's a huge big industry problem, and and what you described is 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 is, is I'm intimately involved in it. It's not a trivial problem in a at scale. Okay. But um, in for the people that are having whether they're beagle bones or whatever with some variety of of shields or whatever they're called um, attached to them, having suddenly a standard that would allow us to have to just self-describe without, you know, device tree overlays and all this other stuff, I think would be in itself a major win that way. Even if what you meant was that I had to take my existing shield 
and I stick another shield on top of it that just has the IE squared prom on it to describe the, 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 the existing one that I so bought. So I mean, uh, yeah, in the Beagle world, we've, um, the way we we've have been approaching that is with I squared CE proms on our add-in boards, um, we put descriptors on there and then we look into a, a table of device tree overlays and they'll load those in U-boot to describe the hardware. Um, maintaining those set of device tree overlays is a, a, a little challenging, but, but if you But if you've got the descriptor, you could delay that and do that in user space. Couldn't you I, know? I, the, the problem is, is that um, device tree overlay support isn't supported in the, the kernel. So we do, we do support an outer tree patch to ap apply device tree overlays in, um, at runtime, at Linux kernel runtime, um, but that's um, not upstream. And so, but GVSIM lets you not have that, doesn't it? Right, right, right. because Graybus is upstream, and you could just run GVSIM in user space, and it you allows it to end run that problem. Right. Uh, the, yeah. the challenge now, and, and for most small IoT devices, it probably doesn't matter. The challenge now is GVSIM is sitting there running, um, you know, in user space, and it's essentially taking what would be kernel I squared C and SPI accesses and moving them into user space and doing SPI dev and I2C dev accesses. Um, it, it, from a, at least it makes the, 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 the top level of code kind of clean because it's using the kernel interfaces. Um, but now you're, you're kind of burying the problem in, in GBSIM. And you know, ultimately, like getting rid of GBSIM and making GBSIM uh, an abstraction layer in the kernel would be cool. Um, like that would be really cool. But I think, so I'm, I'm really interested in why you think the, the wireless network adapters um, in order for, to expose these interfaces won't be something that works at scale. I think there was someone in the back. Oh, I was yeah. just gonna, you just said GBSIM abstraction layers. So I was going to ask you how will that work? Oh. Because wouldn't you need the spy and ISPC driver in the kernel anyway? And then why would you use Grebus? Because it can just talk to the peripherals. Right. So, um, so, so you still need something to tell the, the, the kernel um, you know, that the device is there because it's not probable. Right. So this, this is kind of the fund of the, this is one of the fundamental problems we're solving here with Graybus is that we've now got this int click routine, like a you know, script um, in, in Python that you could say, um, you know, the device is there. Um, and you, you tell GBSIM to essentially go and provide the manifest to the kernel and then the device, um, the device driver comes up. So it's, it's, it's that hook to tell the kernel that the device is there. Yeah, but your transport also changes to come back to user space and then go to I squared C or spy, right? Right, which is definitely less than ideal. That is yeah. why this is, that's, that's sort of the, you know, the development vehicle. It's, it's not so much where we're looking to go for deployment, right? And that's, that's why I'm really interested in Michael's comment that he doesn't think it can scale because if it, if it doesn't scale, I've got a bigger problem. The, uh, the, the multiple um, syscall overhead is actually kind of dwarfed by the uh, latency of the transport in a lot of cases. So um, if you've got 802.15.4, you're not really transmitting tons of data at a really fast rate. So a few extra syscalls isn't really gonna hurt. A anything running, anything with a CPU running Linux, um, even at 20 megahertz is probably, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was gonna say, well, they're really slow now, can be really slow these days too again, right? Even at a relatively, you would think, pedestrian pace, is probably doing all that stuff way faster than the data I.O. is ever gonna do it. So those abstraction layers are probably not worth really fixing unless someone is concerned about battery uh, power on that thing, at which point it's worth someone to fix. I would be more concerned about some drivers in particular in the mm -hmm. I2C field um, relying on particular timing on the device. I'm assuming that this is like a very simple command response protocol, Graybus, so that would have a delay between like two subsequent operations. Where you know like some device might enter sleep modes or something like in between. I, I agree, I think that there, are, I mean, Graybus was initially designed to work on the wire, so immediate, almost immediate reaction times. Um, I, I would say that may a possible improvement in the future would be to schedule things. Uh, uh, and so like in, in batches. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, I think there was some uh, time synchronization code that was originally 
in the gray bus specification. Greg, Greg just walked out, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, he needed Andres, some hardware. Uh, Alexander might know. Yeah, I think there was some time synchronization code originally in gray bus, uh, but I'm not sure if it's quite active anymore. That was hardware specific. Aspect. Yes, yeah. We removed it from the kernel. It was uh, too much of a prototype type of thing to, uh, yeah, go into main. Okay. Well, one thing I guess you really talked about is the fact that you know we were working on this prototype to have, um, you know, this functionality working, and one of the issues was um, having the. The G bridge, right, in, in Netlake and getting that upstream, right? I don't know if you wanted to talk about that. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, so, uh, Alexander gave his really great presentation a few years ago about Graybus at um, ELC, I believe, or ELC Europe. Okay. Um, so, we've done a little bit of work on G bridge since then. Uh, one of the things we added was. Um, fairly strong authentication and encry well, encryption because as a wire protocol, it was not encrypted uh, as such um, directly like, you know, on board. Uh, so we added RSA uh, authentication. Um, so it follows the standard, uh, you present your public key, I present my public key, we provide a randomized challenge uh, and then shared AES session key. Uh, so that's one thing we did. And then the next thing was Right. Yeah. Oh, um, net, uh, he did. He did the netlink as well. Um, and then I guess uh, so. The the big thing was really uh, just porting Graybus over to Zephyr, uh, and so that's imminently releasable. Uh, we were gonna have it demo today, uh, but we're just doing it over UART right now, which isn't uh, you know much much of an advance. Uh, it's the same thing that Alexander had uh, demoed. Uh, uh, just on a different platform. So we're using the CC1352R, uh, which is both VLE and 802.15.4. Uh, so you can run these radio protocols simultaneously. So currently in Zephyr, there is a patch by Brett Witherspoon. I'm not sure if he's here today, um, but that's going up into Zephyr. Uh, it's in review right now, and we've been actively dialoguing about 15.4. Um, I was probably going to put in a patch for BLE support for this chip within the next couple of days. Just didn't quite make it for this one, uh, but it's quite it's quite exciting. In any case, just seeing a you know a, a GPIO turn off and on over Gray Bus, um, and then of course the you know strong authentication and stuff like that. Um, is it the other thing was what needs to happen in the upstream Linux kernel for this to um, you know with the device tree overlay stuff, we don't want to be relying on something that's not upstream. Um, so I think uh, someone had brought up device tree overlay and, oh, Michael, uh, you'd brought up device tree overlay and um, I think? It wasn't Michael, it was Craig. It was shared ahead of Craig. Okay, so we have the gray bus manifest. Uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. You, you just take uh, a given example template uh, modified to suit your needs so it It'll say that you know this device has such and such number of GPIOs, an I squared C bus, or you could even abstract the I squared C bus out of the equation and just say it has a sensor here, um, which is quite nice. Um, then um, the proposal we made on the gray bus uh, dev mailing list was to uh, take some of the device tree syntax and add that as properties to the gray bus manifest. So that, for example, say you had an I squared C temperature sensor that would uh, alert you when a temperature exceeded a particular threshold using a GPIO interrupt. Currently, Graybus has no way of saying this I squared C device is paired to this GPIO interrupt by name because that's how device tree works in the Linux kernel. Uh, so we were just going to say, uh, you know, this is our I squared C zero device by name, and this is the um, GPIO that it's paired with. And so, oh, I've got a mic. Um, and as associated with that, there's there's also not a lot of consistency in I/O drivers, depending on what additional platform data they might need. It, what has become consistent is that they expose whatever additional properties they need through device tree. So that's been pushed through hard. Um, so if they need extra stuff, 
um, somewhat at the loss of arguments to modprobe, right? So like a lot of times you can't specify them through through modprobe anymore because everybody's like just gone so hardcore on device tree only. Um, even though if they really had the option, right, they could put the if statements in to get it one way or the other. Um, but you know, so if you want random I squared C IO driver, you know, you're going to need to provide some some additional platform. That's why I think using something like the microbus um, stuff, where you know, it's just kind of uh, it's got a, a, a full enough set, and a, a, you know, also a simple enough set that if you know, if I want an interrupt, right, I've got a, a particular I/O pin defined for interrupt. Um, that can be remapped on a on a platform specific way um, within the, the implementation and hidden from um, you know what we do for um, all the, the gray bus device drivers. Stefan, you had brought up that great slide comparing all the different real time operating systems and their various support for 802.54. Uh, I almost wish you had done the same thing for BLE or at least maybe we had um, because the initial prototype we had was this close to working on Contiki with BLE, except, um, and I should clarify too, um, the thing that we were focusing on was to use IPv6, so six low pen over BLE 802.15.4. So it's just a unified socket layer. Um, and ideally, we would really love to have LoRa as well, uh, kind of accessible via socket um, and addressable via six low pen or something like that. Um, but in any case, um, we, where is it going to this? Um, the uh, the, the issue with Contiki is that it did not support a fairly recent RFC for uh, nearest neighbor discovery. The bigger problem with Contiki, is on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the bigger problem with Contiki is that there is hardly a main line. I mean, it's got better again, but it was really, really ugly in, in, in the recent years where they have like, at least 10 or 15 different like branches of Contiki where not branches in a, in a Git repository like but branches of like being forked basically. And I mean that's really a hard problem. I think they are going to get that solved by now. But I mean you can't really reference to what Contiki version actually supports the needs of your BLE whatever you have there because you can't redefine what, what the main line is there. I found as well to add to that is that um, <coughs> the uh, Zephyr abstraction layer for Bluetooth particularly and even 802.15.4, is much more generic. So it can actually apply to several hardware vendors, whereas Contiki was fairly uh, specific and it was rather difficult to make changes even. I mean, you can see where it comes from. I mean, Zephyr people th that designed the Bluetooth stuff there are coming from doing it in Bluesy before in the Linux kernel. Mm -hmm. So they basically have been building around what we have like being vendor agnostic. Mm -hmm. And Contiki was more like driven by the vendors itself and then just merged it in. Yeah, so we're hoping to put most of our effort into Zephyr at this point, uh, just to leverage that great abstraction layer. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm I'm hoping that that um, a lot of the kind of open challenges, like the, of getting people to collaborate on all this on the on the I O I O T stuff, because you know, so much of it is you know we've got the ugly user space uh, driver hacks, we've got um, stuff that doesn't uh, doesn't live in the kernel or has isn't really good. Outside of different uh, distros, right? Like the the sys class um, sort of interfaces, right? That are using the standard Linux driver. So if we if we can do things to make it easier for people to use Linux, um, you know, and even now, you know, putting Linux interfaces through a, you know a wireless microcontroller bridge, uh, you know, I, I, and, and doing it in an open way that other people can implement on their own stacks, I think it I think it has a lot of so so this is really interesting, and, I, and you guys have presented this as kind of like, this is how you talk to your GPIOs, right? And, but I think you just <laughs> It's a lot of, more than that, right? Right, but, but I think you just fell over the edge that actually, and you just said, well, you're doing it over 15.46 low pan with Zephyr. Well, you know what? You're not, you, you described built as a, as a discoverable network protocol. There are a bunch of other ones out there that, that do similar things, but they don't generally do them at the level that, that that you've described it, and so obviously to people, okay? So when we were talking earlier about are there, you know, reasons to have Linux gateways into 802.15.4 networks, well, you've just, you just, you've just created that. Yeah. Okay, um, so, um, so you've, just, you've just come over the hill from a different direction than we've been walking up a hill 
too, right? So it's nice to meet you at the top of the hill, right? <laughs> <laughs> Are there any uh, Zephyr developers in the room, just out of curiosity? None. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We'll have to talk later. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely have to talk with you later. Um, how much time? Are we, what are we at on a time check? All right, so we're over. We're basically done. Uh, any other questions? So we're hopefully we, we've drawn some things, some thoughts out over the next couple of days of things that you'll know, look. Check out the Etherpad. Continue to add action items for people here and for yourself and for things that you follow up. Right. The point of this is not to just kind of give you a big technology survey. We actually want to go and solve problems now. Right. So we, you know like attack us, right? You know, um, attack each other in, in a constructive way. Um, so the etherpad is the, the primary mechanism for kind of following up here at the conference, and then we'll go off into the mailing list and things um, afterwards and later. So um, please engage, come up and talk to us in person. Our contact emails on there. Is there any other things we need for contact while we're at the show? Um, not that I know of. Um, Yep. Find the people that you need to collaborate with and collaborate. Definitely. Anybody that wants to talk to me about Zephyr, uh, BLE, please, after, the, after this week. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>